Closed Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carter. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. This is part two of two with my friend and teammate, Dom Rasso. He left the military, the SEAL teams, to start Dynamis Alliance. You can find out more about that at crusheverything.com. But uh, we met at SEAL Team 2 years ago uh, before he went to Naval Special Warfare Development Group to go crush it for a few years before getting out and starting that next chapter in life. So now, without further ado, Dom Rasso. Have you been to the UDT SEAL Museum? Yeah. Yeah. That place is awesome. That was cool. Really cool. I, I, I can only think of if I was a kid watch, seeing that stuff and exactly. walking through there, I would have been like, yeah, this is it. That was I would have geeked out. Really cool. Yeah, yeah cool. I went down and uh, I did it on the second book tour. I hadn't been there. I did a book signing fairly close to there. And um, Rick Kaiser was the, uh, yeah. he's involved somewhere up he's top. He's still there, yeah. Yeah, he's up there somewhere somewhere managing that thing. He and he did an incredible job with that place. Now a few other people are, are involved as well. But um what a amazing museum. And if you're, I had that same thought is that uh, if I was a kid, if I was nine years old, 10 years old, 11 years old, even coming to this place, or even younger, seven, eight, nine, uh, I would 100% ha- want to be a SEAL, but I already did at that point. But what an experience. I would never yeah. forget that. It was, it's such a, a cool spot. So for anybody listening, you should totally check that place out. It's a little 100%. off the beaten path, tiny bit, but not much. I mean, you just got to make a make a plan and, and go and check it it's out. It's worth spend, it. Yeah. If I was still geeking out in there today, then I think anybody else would geek yeah. out. I'd appreciate it yeah. to become a SEAL, mm-hmm. you know? They had all the latest gear in there. I was actually blown away by some of the gear that was in there. I was like, oh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, that and you walk through the history and yep. you, can, you can trace the whole history and you look at that gear and how it's morphed over time, find out why, um, why we're called men with green faces, why it's called the frogman, why all, where all these things came from. Uh, a lot of it I didn't even know. And I'm talking 2019, I yeah. went down there and there were some <laughs> things that I, uh, I, and I thought I was pretty up to, up to speed on in Naval Special Warfare history. And I learned a ton walking through that place. Yeah. It was really cool. It was great for the kids too. Yeah, I need to bring to some my of the kids obstacle there. Courses, so it was cool. Obstacle courses there. You have all that, uh, the outside area is amazing. Then the museum is amazing. You walk across the street to that beach. It's a, it's a great spot. But uh, speaking of gear, uh, at some point along the line, uh, at your time at that command, you start coordinating with these companies out there to get that quicker turnaround, mm-hmm. and eventually it becomes a business that gets signed off on by the command, right. um, which uh, wasn't abnormal no. back then. Uh, people might today say, oh, after what's happened over the last 10 years, right. uh, when things kind of hit a tipping point and Everyone lost their minds for a bit. Not everyone. Certain senior level leaders lost their minds for a little bit. That's correct. Um, <laughs> uh, but it was fairly normal out there for guys to be doing things. And this was just made sense. Yeah. It seemed like you had guys who were passionate about gear, who are already helping these other companies out there that are now, now not just uh, doing those turnarounds on gear for your team, for your command, but for other commands, for law enforcement agencies. For the uh, for citizens, uh, and so you guys form this uh, this business that gets signed off on by the command, and you do that for a few years, or how long is that going on? Uh, did you talk to Mark about this, by the way? I did on the podcast. Uh, we, I don't think we called we took, we don't think we saw, called it by name. Okay, but we talked about business, yeah. yeah, yeah. I was just curious. Stuff. I was curious how much detail you know you guys went into, and it's it's something that I really haven't talked about because part of it was being a pioneer. Yeah. At that point for what we were doing here. And I like to, I like to lay the groundwork of understanding why we were doing what we we're doing. Because if you don't look at it through the right lens, I think it can be misunderstood. Yeah. And perception Agreed. clearly is reality in a lot of cases, mm-hmm. especially being in the military or a high level position or an overt type of career. And for me, the way I like to frame it is that I do real estate, right? So when I was in, even at team two, I realized earlier on, I was like, oh, I can buy a house, deploy, rent it. I was like, this makes sense to me. This is actually pretty good. I can save up a little bit of money, just not go out and drink as much. And I can actually invest. So that made sense. That was my passion. And when you're not doing anything else, if you're not actually in the job or or at the command or actually deployed and you're sitting around during the weekend or you're off time, that's how our brains are working. What else can I get into? What other hobby can I take on? What other investment can I get into? 
And naturally for me, I always love gear. Like anytime I, I do something, I'm either working on my own gear or I'm designing something. And we had a bunch of guys that were really pioneering the whole idea of what it meant to work with a modern day vendor and really bring that product to fruition. Well, we weren't doing it all the time for the active duty purpose. We found an opportunity to do it as a hobby. Like we have extra time, let's see what we can do here. And there was opportunities that would open up um, for things, like you said, people needing required things that didn't have the skill set to be able to build them, um, whether it was for somebody in the military, law enforcement, or even developing a bag better for somebody mm -hmm. else or developing a light better for somebody mm -hmm. else. And we were very, very, very careful earlier on not to have any conflict of interest. Right. Clearly, the most important thing for us was being at the command and, and operating at that level. And the way we are for our our reputation and our brotherhood, we would never want to put that at stake. That wasn't something we wanted to risk. So this was a hobby. This was an opportunity for us to invest and to do something outside of the, the command. And I think that that was a cool aspect of it. It was fun for us. We were intrigued by it. We had a core group of guys that were really good at designing stuff. And mm -hmm. I learned a lot, you know, working with guys like Mark, working mm -hmm. with guys like uh, some of the guys. Yeah. One of the guys actually isn't here anymore. Um, but that also taught me a lot about what it means to be an entrepreneur yeah. and to work at this level. So even before I was out, that was right. I was working on different pieces of gear, things that I really enjoyed doing. I would spend all my time off on the weekend tweaking other things for other people, but enjoy doing it. Yeah. So yeah, it was, it was interesting, you know. Yeah, that was that was cool. I remember when you guys were were doing that, and then uh, and then the guys were sent, a, lot, a lot of guys were just doing that. You know, it was very natural to go to let's say shot show, and uh, all of a sudden sit down with somebody who designed a piece of gear that you used downrange, uh, not even it put together in like a meeting. It just kind of happened. Like, oh, you did this because you're meeting so many people and you're shaking hands or whatever, and you're ha having drinks. And a lot of guys went out there to check out new gear. A lot of guys went out there just to have a great time because it happens to be in Vegas. Uh, sometimes those things combined. Um, but uh, all of a sudden you're talking to somebody who is a designer or a project manager at a company who doesn't have any military experience maybe, or maybe they had it a while in the past. And you find out, wait a sec, you designed the you know, X, Y, or Z. I used that on my last deployment. Dude, that was awesome. Thank you. Or I used the last deployment. And you know what? If you tweak this one little thing, or here's what guys are doing. Yes. What we're doing with that piece of kit is we're doing this to it. And then that designer guy is, oh, that's awesome. I'm going to go, we're going to change that up for next time. All of a sudden you see it. Um, so sometimes that, all that stuff just happened naturally. Yeah. Uh, and then I think it started to evolve into, oh, okay, maybe we just don't have to stumble into somebody at a bar uh, after the shot show's over and randomly find out that they worked on some scope or some whatever that I was using. Uh, and then that's how I tell them how to make it better. Uh, maybe we can set up a meeting, see you next year, and we'll tell you, I'll use the new one and I'll let you know how, how it went. Uh, so all that stuff just became very natural because why wouldn't you it did. tell the person yeah. <laughs> that designed the thing that you're using how to make it better when your life depends on yeah. it downrange. So, um, and then you guys took it to, um, you know, made it, uh, took it to that next level where you got to work on things, I think not just for, for military, but law enforcement or whatever else, just gear uh, in yeah. general, because you were good at it, passionate about it. And it actually helped you, happened to help you professionally. But a lot of guys did things on the outside like that. It wasn't abnormal. Yeah. at all until yeah it, it transcended too you know first it started with being in the military and realizing like if i look at a guy right now even to today in 2022 from head to toe from the strobe light all the way down to the shoes that they're wearing i can name a point at which me or some of these other guys were involved in the design development of these things. It's mm -hmm. crazy. I mean, I'm looking at the OpsCore helmet <laughs> now, and I'm like, oh yeah, I remember I made them do the little bump out that made it go over the lip. Like there's very subtle changes. The DNA is there mm -hmm. though. And that's what it takes, that creativity, that process that was created to knowing that we can go right to the vendor, right to the designers and vice versa. We work together, have a really good relationship and make the best gear in the world. As soon as you try to stop that or, or slow that process down, it, it affects the guys on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. And ultimately that's the goal is to get those guys the best equipment. So just like anybody else, like I was talking about fighting, if I had to choose where I would go, it would be a fighting trip. Mm -hmm. If somebody was a really good climber, it's intuitive, intuitive for them to go and say, who's the best climber out there or the best gear maker and let me go work with them. Yeah. Why wouldn't you want that real world experience connected to their gear and then watch that, that take place? You know, that really wasn't an incentive for us in the military. You know, people were saying, oh, you're giving up millions of dollars of ideas to these companies. 
And I was like, so what? I was like, that's the goal. The whole goal is to get a guy to be more efficient so we can save lives and protect our guys. And that was always the incentive. And then later towards the end of our career, it was kind of like, oh, well, I'm still passionate about this. I still want to do it. Just like you would go climb or you would go ski or you would go do something else. I like playing with gear, mm -hmm. you know? So it just ended up being a side project and a side yeah. hobby. And like I said, that whole idea of like, we had a business uh, built around that was because we were passionate about it. Yeah. And we were pioneering that idea. Like, hey, is it cool if we do this? Because we like doing it, you know, yeah. but. And you guys got it signed off on. And then of, uh, you know, of course, when No Easy Day comes out, things shift and that Mark's involved with shift your company. Or... So, and it <laughs> explode. explode. Yeah, so, oh, uh, and Mark and I talked about this when he was on the podcast, uh, you know, about them going after anyone that he was associated with to put pressure on him because now he's out. And so how do you put pressure on someone that's out? Well, you go to their friends who maybe they're still in and you can apply pressure there to get that Mark to take an action Which that you want. Yeah. Me and a, and a handful of other people. Uh, yeah, that's another crazy part of my journey, right? Um, you know, Mark and I are, are great friends, you know, and for a while we did a lot of cool stuff together. Uh, but when that happened, it was a very interesting moment in I'm sure both of our lives where we were navigating through this unchartered territory in a lot of ways. And there was, there was some unnecessary pressure and hunting going on for the wrong stuff, yeah. for the wrong reasons. I mean, I remember sitting there and having people, I won't go into too much detail. I gotta be just, yeah, I'm yeah. gonna navigate this, but I'm sitting around other people that are essentially trying to figure out how to get him in trouble, right? And they don't know how close I am to him. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there and I remember like, man, these guys are going to the nth degree to try to persecute him. And at the end of the day, what they're saying is completely false and not true. Mm -hmm. And so they basically ended up going down on a witch hunt yeah. about all these different aspects of, of who he was, what yeah. he did, uh, what we were involved in. And it was kind of sad to see. It was a little, it was kind of discouraging in a way where it's like, man, is this what we've deduced ourselves to, to get to this level where we can't look out for another guy? You know, no matter who you are in this community, I believe that there should still be some type of a connectivity you know, if it mattered that much then, it should matter that much now. And to be able to have that open dialogue. Now, I can't tell you how many times I tried to open up dialogue and I was completely just shut down because somebody didn't want to hear it. Yeah. And they totally missed the idea and the point of which I was trying to bring up. And I think with that closed-mindedness, that's kind of why I was led to just say, you know what, there's, there's a better way for me in this world to continue to grow and increase in what I want to bring to the table. And I felt like there was a lot of areas where it was like, why didn't I do 20 years? Well, because I really feel like I was hitting a glass ceiling yeah. in so many different areas of my life, uh, both tactically, professionally, and personally. Mm -hmm. I think that was a big decision, a big factor that kind of was the spark of, this is getting kind of ridiculous. Yeah. And then there's a whole nother aspect to that, the helo going down, my mom passing away. And it was this perfect storm for me yeah. at, at that time. It was all happening at the same moment. Yeah. Um, so it was very, a lot of pressure, a right. lot of unknown, a lot of like, what is happening? Yeah. Super surreal to look back on. But. Right. When you look at those those three kind of seminal events um, and take them individually, um, it was like, I, I got very discouraged when I saw how uh, Mark was treated and how the community, 100%. Uh, and how we, especially, you know, not just from the senior level leaders who dictate some policy and feign outrage or maybe become outraged, um, who knows, um, but from some senior level enlisted guys who are, oh, what have you been doing for the last 10 years on the weekend out there at Blackwater teaching tactics and whatever, and all of a sudden, now you're getting some guys that are a little more junior to you that maybe not be Master Chiefs, that maybe aren't Master Chiefs, and you're busting those guys for something. I don't know, just the hypocrisy thing has always gotten me. Um, that, that side, that I just, uh, and I saw a lot of that in that situation from some people yep. that uh, I would have hoped not to see it from, that I, I would have hoped to see them stand up and uh, maybe help a friend that's hurting or whatever it might be. But instead they turned, maybe just pretended, with, pretended that uh, what they'd been doing for the last 10 years, five years, whatever, 15 years, uh, they hadn't been doing perhaps. And now yeah. uh, they kind of do as I say, not as I do. So there's a lot of that going on in that time frame. But did you see that? And then was that something that uh, added to your decision to get out? 
Yeah, a hundred percent it did. But you know, when when you look at that the leadership and some of the the hypocrisy that was going on, you know, I always make it a point to kind of remind myself first, and then outwardly remind you know because we're we're talking to people and we're discussing this 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 subject, is that the organization, the unit itself, is as amazing and fruitful as it's been in the past and what it can continue to do in the world. I never want to lose sight of that, yeah. you know, because some of these guys from a bad leadership perspective made some bad decisions. I'll always, because I know what it did for me and I know what it continues to do for people, in a sense, protect the sense of brotherhood and it protects the sense of that unit that's, that's there. God's obviously, his hand is working through so many of the amazing things that have happened for the good of the world mm. to be that shield. But I always want to make a point to say that because just like I always talk about the church, because there's bad guys in the church, doesn't make me hate the church. Mm -hmm. It just makes me understand that mm -hmm. there's broken men, there's men out there that aren't going to live by these things. And it is disappointing. It is discouraging. Because mm -hmm. I've seen guys that I respected be like, man, you got to be kidding me. At this moment of pressure, at this moment of scrutiny, you're going to fold. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the sad part. Um, but, you know, each one of those events culminated to making that decision. Yeah. Um, there's so much to talk about uh, to make that decision for me, uh, both with, you know, Mark, the book, the point of where, where I was in my life, the Hilo and, and my mother passing away, it all added up. It was a big yeah. math equation to be like, it just pointed to that direction. Um, even, you know, my brother, which was living up north and was living with my mother and you know when her, she passed away that influenced me to make the decision yeah so yeah it was just a it definitely definitely helped me make that choice yeah. it wasn't hard and then you add politics on top of it you know i was out there you know you talk about the three types of guys that are in the teams it was the guys that were there before that mm -hmm. never, that hadn't done much war kicked off like this is great and when it got back to being normal like oh well, we're just back to the way it's supposed to be mm -hmm. and you had guys like me that were super spoiled, hit the ground running, and I was shooting at people my first deployment. And then when it was slowing down, I was like, this is this sucks. Like, where's where is this? This is where we're supposed to be. Right. And then you have the third guy, which has never done any of that, and he's looking for the war. He's looking mm. to go on the hunt, and nothing's happening. Yeah. Uh, but ultimately, I felt like because politics started to play a factor in it too, I was just like, this just isn't the right place for me. Mm -hmm. You know, how many ops are we gonna go on per year? You know, that the politics hands are in everything that we're doing. You know, I feel like the, I felt that political pressure come down. Like, what are you guys up to in here? And it's just hamstringing our ability mm -hmm. to perform. I hope that that's been fixed o over the past several years. Maybe, maybe not. But that all led to me making that decision. Yeah. What was that? Was, uh, did your mom pass away first? Was that before all that? Was that the first so the culminating event? My mom passed away right around the time that the Gila went down. So basically, my mom had cancer. I had never stayed home from a deployment before. And when I found out she had cancer, I didn't know much about cancer. I'm like, mom, like, what's going on here? Like, do I go with the guys or not? And you know, not leaving is a really difficult choice. It's not something especially guys that want to be in the fight want to make. It was one of the hardest choices I've ever made professionally, um, especially when you know guys are looking at you like, you're not coming on deployment. And they but made I, you, that, did they make your leadership put that on you? Like as a leader, there are things that I did and made the decision for someone. And sometimes you have to do that. Yeah. And sometimes it's quite appropriate to do that. No, um, I made the decision. That's interesting. I, mean, I made the decision. Because I can only think that, at that level, I would not though, put that on the Yeah, but at the that operator. level, there's just, now. I'd make you stay home is what I'm saying. Right, but right now, Maybe I could walk into the squadron and maybe there would be somebody like that with, with that heart and that empathy. But at the time, man, I mean, you get, mm. you got to figure the operational tempo that we were in, mm. you're so intense in getting in that door and getting on the mission. That's like, if there was any flicker of you needing to stay home for anything, I mean, it had to be pretty serious. Mm. You know, people get cancer. So it's like my mom having cancer and me not knowing really what cancer was, justifying me not being on deployment, was hard for even me to reconcile. And, and it's, I had to ask my mother, like, hey, mom, like, how serious is this? Like, is this, like, are you gonna be here? Is this gonna be healed? Are you gonna, is this gonna be terminal? And she was probably pretty wishy-washy with me too, mm -hmm. not necessarily knowing herself. And then when I kind of asked her one day, when I was like, mom, like, you gotta be real with me here. Like, I gotta make this decision. 
And she just looked at me and she's like, it's pretty bad. And I, I knew right then and there, I was like, okay. That this, this is something that I can either let my pride get in the way and go on deployment because I want to be on deployment and then pray through and hope that when I get back, everything's fine. Mm-hmm. Or I can make the decision to be here and take care of her, which at that point, if that was the case, I would want to do everything I possibly could to know that I did everything for her if that happened. And uh, that made me click to make the decision. I'm like, okay, I'm going to stay home with you. And at the time, it wasn't too bad. But it, it, it digressed and went downhill pretty fast mm-hmm. uh, on that deployment. Uh, she started her cre- chemo treatments. She started going to uh, get help. And it was basically me and my brother were taking care of her the entire time. And there was a, there was a f- point where which I was like, I definitely made the right decision because mm-hmm. I could see her crashing. Yeah. And I was up north taking care of her in New England. And I was doing the back and forth thing where I was starting to stay up there more and more because all the guys were on deployment. I actually got with one of the troops uh, that were training up north. And so they were, they were doing something up there, you know, and I got with those guys. So we were actually training at a high level. I was taking care of my mom. They were in the area. And right after that huge training event wrapped up, I literally got done and uh, the helo had went down right after this training event happened. And I found out the helo was down. Like I got that phone call, no idea. You know, my guys are overseas. No idea which troop it was at the time. So I was like, you know, I'm thinking the worst. You know, all of it's bad. Every one of them is bad because I had worked with both guys, but there was my troop that was deployed and then there was two troop, which was deployed. And I had just been with two troop the previous deployment. So I was with those guys on the assault force, you know, getting in as, with them as much as I could. I was with Adam when he was killed. Um, I wasn't actually on the operation with Adam, but I was in, in country, you know, I was with him right before it had happened. But in that moment, I was just thinking the worst possible case scenario. And so my mom is crashing. I go down to say, okay, the healer went down. I'm helping out as much as possible. I mean, you want to talk about chaos, like the chaos that was going on in the command at that moment. I was one of the only guys back from my squadron, which it had happened to. So it was like this uh, just almost out-of-body experience happening right in front of me because everyone was just spinning and I'm just sitting there trying to wrap my head around what just happened. Um, so that's all unfolding. You know, I'm literally sitting there looking at all the paperwork everybody's pulling out to try to figure out what to do next and how we notify people. Uh, yeah. It's hard to talk about that stuff, this stuff, but I would say uh, the toughest decision of that was when they didn't really know that I was part of the squadron because I had people just, and they were just doing their job. It's like, I don't blame anybody. But then getting, you know, the piece of paper put in front of me, kind of smacked on the desk, almost like, hey, like, you, can, can you uh, help us out and figure out, you know, who you're going to notify? Like, that was just crushing. So I did, I did what I could and I, you know, tried to prayerfully, I think with some collaboration, I got some help in figuring out who to choose. Um, and so that was the start of that whole process with the helo. And then knowing that it happened to all my guys and then really goes into almost like a black, I blacked out on a lot of this stuff, almost like not blacked out, but, you know, oh, yeah. went into a gray space in my life. Uh, I decided that I'm going to deploy. I was like, that's it. I got to go over there. The guys just, we just lost a whole troop of dudes. You need me. Like they need me. And uh, I had made the decision like pretty much right then and there, I got to be overseas. So I had called my leadership and said, Hey guys, like I'm coming over. Like I'm, I got to be there for you. And I remember my master chief at the time was like, dude, that is awesome. We're so pumped that you're going to be over here. Thank you. I was really hoping that you were going to make that decision. So you could tell he was kind of holding on to some mm-hmm. stuff of me being home. I don't want to speculate on that too much, but ultimately I made that decision. So I started to pack my bags um, in the midst of, you know, trying to do as much as I could for the, the chaos that just was within the logistics of, of having to manage everything that, that just happened with the helo. And then I got a phone call that basically said, hey, your mother's crashing hard. So then I, ba- I was like, okay, I dropped everything I could because they were afraid that she only had a couple of days left. 
So I dropped all my bags in a sense, you know, like mm-hmm. as the analogy, like half packed in my cage and I flew back up north. And basically I flew back in. I had about probably a day and a half with my mom and then she ended up passing away. All right. So we were all there. It was good. We were around her, um, being able to see her, you know, take her last breath. But then I had to bury my mom. So I'm not thinking like, oh, you know, let me go and alert everybody that I'm not going to go. But I did call my team leader and maybe he'll listen to this and, and, you know, take a note on this. But I called my team leader and said, hey, I'm not going to be able to make it. I got to bury my mother. Like that's a clear choice, right? I don't have to think about that. So me really being the only provider for her, she had nobody else to take care of her. I had to get everything set up, you know, for her funeral and everything that she had to do in the midst of still trying to manage what was going on with the guys in the squadron. So that kind of unfolded along the way. And, you know, when after buried her, continued to go help out with the squadron down in Virginia Beach. And when my guys got back home, Dude, my master chief was pissed. He literally came up to me and was like, where were you? I thought you said you were coming overseas. And like, he was literally angry at me. And I was like, hey man, I was like, I, did my team leader tell you like my mom passed away? And like his whole demeanor like changed, like almost like he just turned white. He's like, oh, I was like, yeah, I told my team leader to tell you like my mom passed away, I couldn't make it. But he had it in his head that I was gonna come. so. There was multiple guys in the squadron that were like, Dom just didn't show up. Dom just didn't come on deployment. I mean, you can, you know how damaging that is as, as a team guy. Somebody says they're going to do something and they don't follow through. And that's the expectation. So I think there was some guys some kind of harboring some discontent with, with my performance, not coming on deployment, but they didn't know that my mom had passed away. Um, and then there was a lot of politics and a lot of stuff going on with how things were being managed with the families, with, with the guys, with their gear. I mean, it was intense. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm literally searching through all the guys, guys that I love, their gear, you know? So, you know, that, that journey kind of all just was together. That, that, that all was happening. Meanwhile, even so, the book, right? Kind of around the same time frame of kind of transpiring mm-hmm. and, and some of the stuff that was going on. Uh, and then that kind of leading me to the point where I was like, clearly this is the right decision for me to get out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. So did you, did you have to go to those, you went to those funerals right after your mom's funeral? You went to the guys? Yeah. Pretty much they coincided with one another. Dude. Like it was, that was like a, I was in the fray, you know? I was in Arlington. I was flying over the country. I tried to make every possible funeral I could. Mm-hmm. Every funeral that took place, I tried to be there. I was hopping on planes, back, driving across country. I mean, it was, it was intense, you know? And I was just trying, I did my best to just be a pillar, mm-hmm. you know? Because some of the guys were gone, you know? And uh, I was the only dude that was, not the only dude, obviously there was multiple guys there that knew a lot of people because of our community. But as far as people being deployed, Mm -hmm. like I was the only guy that was back to each one of these funerals. So I'm literally, you know, I knew all the dudes from two troop, you know? So it was intense. Man. Yeah. I remember I was deployed at the time. So I did, you know, we we stayed deployed obviously um, when that happened. But um, man, so you go through all that and I can only imagine the after effects of coming out of something like that uh, from your mom to all those funerals. And then you take a breath maybe on the other side. And then what happens? Did you decide, you haven't decided to get out yet. Do you deploy again or do you? No, I didn't deploy. After that fact, I ended up taking a a position at the command. Um, It was pretty cool. It was actually, you know, one of the first times I had decided like, okay, I should probably like pull back for a second here. Yeah. And that was, I, I was intentional about that. Yeah. I actually went to my leadership and was like, look, like not to say that any one of us is, is struggling any differently than anybody else, but I had also moved my brother down to Virginia. Mm. And at the time, um, man, how old is he? He was young, 18, yeah. 17, 18. I, he was still really young. Yeah. So I wanted to be able to be there for him as well. And so that, that journey kind of led me to taking a position at the command. It was, it was cool, but I didn't deploy. 
And that, yeah. that started my transition. I yeah. kind of started my realization of like, I should probably start thinking about, yeah. you know, this being a possibility. And we didn't plan for it. Like getting out wasn't necessarily a planned thing. Yeah. I was like, I'm going to spend my whole military career in, in, at the command or whatever mm -hmm. I end up doing. It was never a choice for me until all this stuff started to transpire. Right. And then that's what led me to right. the decision. So like fall of 2011, um, where did you go? Did you do an ops position or a training position? Or I did a, I did the head position for some of the, some of the security stuff. Nice. Okay. At, at the command. Nice. So yeah. you do that, and then while you're in that position, the no easy day comes out, and then Correct. so that's so it's about a year after uh, extortion one seven. Um, so that's like the the third. Yeah. The third sign. Yeah, that, that's uh, right. It was it was a year. It, like I said, that whole block yeah. felt like it was just one, but right. yeah, there was some time. Yeah, but like from fall, like after yeah. you know coming out of Correct. extortion and everything it went along with that, um, you take a breath, you go to the security position, and then a few months later, that summer, so a year after extortion, uh, no easy day hits, and then the, the essentially a tipping point in the community. And there had been talks, of course, before that of, hey, should we really be doing a Hollywood movie with active duty SEALs and move carrier battle groups around and show SDVs and have these uh, submarines and move them around? Like, what is that costing the taxpayer, by the way? I don't know. But regardless, <laughs> um, uh, that was, you know, people were talking about yeah, it. You know, they were talking time. about the other books that were out. They were talking about that sort of thing. It was a conversation like, hey, are we a little too much in the spotlight? Uh, that sort of a thing. And then noisy day, tipping point. You know, yeah. that's the... That's the tipping point. A lot of timing. Mark and I talk about that. that yes. A lot of the timing yes. of that. But um, uh, so that happens. They start going after all Mark's friends, but pressure on him because he's already out. And uh, so it seems like that's the third thing for you that is the signal that uh, maybe it's time. Perhaps it's time to move Correct. on. <laughs> perhaps yeah. I've had sufficient here, uh, yeah. and uh, it's time to move on and get out. Um, so how does that? When you finally, when you make that decision, how long does it take to to out process and get out of the Navy? Uh, we made that decision fairly quickly just because my EAOS was up. And uh, again, we weren't planning on this. So when we were like, you know, you know, they were talking about uh, re-enlisting and they were talking about that, you know, because typically the paperwork comes up, you just sign it. You're like, yeah, okay, I'm good. You don't even think about it. So when that, when that came up, I was like, wait a minute, when is my EAOS? And it was mm. September. Yeah. And September, like, 2012. Uh, I think. Yes. September, 2012. And that came up where- was like, okay, now it's time to get out. You know, it's like, you've got to either make the decision, you got a month. It was like two months to make that choice. And we're like, man, I didn't have, like even my leave, I didn't even use my leave. Oh, wow. You know, it literally happened that quick. Yeah. Maybe I bought it back or whatever the case was. Right. But I didn't have any, any of that transition stuff that happens now. Like yeah. you can go like right. work with people and do that. It was just like, yeah. okay, we're out. Nobody cares. This thing's, everything's, it feels like it's imploding. Politics are coming into play. We're not deploying as much or at least active as much as we were. And that, again, was just my choice clearly that this is time to go. Yeah. You know, yeah. time to continue to do something else. So when you decide that, what's your what's your plan? You start I didn't have formulating. One. Like when you when you start formulating a plan, when you find yeah. when you're like, okay, EOS, oh geez, that's coming up. That means I either stay in or get out. Okay. Time to get out. Um, and now what? What are you thinking? Well, it was a big family meeting. I, I put everybody together. I usually don't make these decisions on my own. I, I wanted people I care about to be a part of it. My wife, uh, my dad, my sisters, uh, they were all on the, on the phone with me. Mm. I kind of laid out some of the things that transpired along the way. And so like, look, this is where I'm at. Um, I have my son, which is here with me. Mm -hmm. And then I had uh, my second child on the way. So she mm. was, my wife was pregnant at the time mm. making this decision. She's like, oh, cool. You're going to get out of the military. We have no idea what we're doing right now. I'm like, yeah, babe, we're good, right? Like, <laughs> trust me. And, you know, along the, along the way, we had collectively made that decision as a family. Like, okay, let's do this. Let's get out. We're going to figure it out. A lot of faith mm. in what that meant for me. And along the way, just one thing happened, happened after another in the right ways. You know, and, and being adaptable and being that entrepreneur, entrepreneur, I figured that out. Uh, working with several people, obviously a big part of that was working with the NRA. Mm -hmm. uh, really enjoyed a lot of people. That was all, that all happened because of relationships. Yeah. That all happened because of people that I care about, people that I, that I loved and looked up to and respected. Yeah. Uh, Rick, you know, yeah. so many people that were just an influence on me right. uh, as far as being a patriot and really standing for our values. That was an area where at SHOT Show, we just simply had a conversation where I was like, hey, I wish I could do more. And this was literally the January after I got out, which is 
September, you know, a few months later. Yeah. And they're like, you know, we might have this position that we're starting to do. They had Coleon Noir. Yeah. Uh, they had either he was or I was the first person that they had picked for this whole freestyle network. Yeah. Might have been him. And then that was the spark to this whole new campaign that they wanted to do. Yeah, and Amy's in there too. Amy Robbins is in there. Amy Amy Robbins is in there. Uh, Natalie Foster. And some great people came along the way. They were like, we might have this thing where you could help us out. I was like, well, you know what? I know the Second Amendment is under attack. That's really important to me. I see how important it is now, even more so, getting out of the military. So what can I do? And that's what I asked. And then they eventually led me down this road of like, well, you know, you can go in front of the camera and start talking about this. And I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. No clue. I mean, literally the first time in front of the camera, I was so nervous and so like out of my know. I want to watch your first one because they were all great. The ones I've seen are all great. They're still so good. Like I'm sure people can find them on YouTube or whatever, but um, like they're so good. Like you're in there and you're like, boom, lay out those points. And like, they're still good today and they're still applicable, obviously, probably even more so today. Um, But I thought those were fantastic. I'd like to see the first one though. I don't don't know if I've ever seen like the first one or was aware of the first one. I'll have to dig it up. I'll have to dig it up. (laughs) One One of the first videos I did. You can definitely tell. But that journey was really intriguing me because I had to educate myself. Mm. I never want to go on camera or say something without knowing mm-hmm. and educating. So I dug into the Constitution. I dug into our values. And man, what I didn't know. Mm. And that's the thing that I really opened my eyes is like, are we doing that for our kids? Are we really making sure that our kids know the Constitution, to know our values, to know that most of the guys that started this country were Christian men that came over here because of differences in values, mm-hmm. to try to come together, to work with one another? Like These are ideas that I just started to become profoundly aware of mm-hmm. and apply to everything that I did. So I'm glad that the videos still have an impact because I tried to keep them principally based. Right. I had so many people trying to influence my, hey, did you talk about this, talk about this. Mm-hmm. Hey, this guy... I've said something on the news yesterday. I'm like, I don't care what people say on the news mm-hmm. yesterday. I'm not trying to pick a fight just because it gets likes and views. Right. I'm here to talk about the truth. Mm-hmm. And believe me, I've said things that I'm sure could have been refined or said even better. You know, we, we all do. We have a, an evolution and a path we're on. But it led me to really educate myself on our history, on our values, and why we're here. Mm-hmm. And I think that that was the best part about that for me. Yeah. But I got stronger in that and I really started to make a good impact working with them. Mm-hmm. And that, that was cool. That, that kind of helped me understand the world a little bit more from both sides. Okay. And does that give you a little breathing room to figure out dynamis or next steps or what you want to do because it, you're it doing something, yeah. you have a, oh, okay, I'm going to do this for a little bit. And what else can I do? Like, is that, how, how did that evolve? How did dynamis evolve? I, I kind of knew dynamis was going to be a thing because I had already... My wife wouldn't let me name my first son or my second son Dynamis. She's like, absolutely not. Uh, but it means the will to fight. Uh, my buddy Drew Sheets. I don't, do you know Drew? No. At all? Um, one of the most warrior type, aggressive in a good way, team guys that I've ever worked with. We went to Buds together. Always mirrored him as a, as a leader in how we need to move mm. when we fight, when we shoot. Um, really respected him. So he told me about what the will to fight meant and that it was Dynamis. And some, ever since that day, it stuck with me. So I was going to do something with the name, and I eventually knew I was going to start a company of, of it. And I've always enjoyed being that entrepreneur. So along that, way, along that pathway of working with the NRA, I kind of just was still tinkering. I was working with Winkler saying, hey, I'd, mm-hmm. I'd love to come up with a blade with you. I'd love to partner and, and try to figure out what I think the best fighting blade in the world is. Let's try to build that. Yeah. And so we just tinkered around, and hundreds of molds later, after using Play-Doh in, in uh, my kid's Play-Doh kit, figuring out what the handle was gonna look like from a forward and reverse grip. I mean, that was born, you know? Yeah, I mean, this thing is like the perfect fighting blade. Like, I love this thing right here. And uh, so this is the first blade that comes out. I remember when you hold this for the first time, yes. you're just like, hmm, okay. And so many people have been inspired by this, like knife makers. Uh, I, I get people all the time that are just starting out like in their garages. They're passionate about yeah. this knife making thing. Maybe it's like a, a side hustle, but they want it to be their main thing. Sometimes they're veterans, sometimes they're not, but they always mention this. And yeah. maybe it's because they know they, we know each other, but I don't think so. Uh, I think they already, because this has been around for a while, um, you know, before anybody knew who I was. Uh, and they are all inspired by this design yeah. right here. They always make a point to, to tell me, which is really cool. It is really uh, cool. They're not copying it. They're just like, 
inspired by it, you know, which is yeah. a, a different deal. But that's, it's humbling because, you know, being in the mode of like, I just genuinely want to make the best fighting knife in the world. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm passionate about. And for it to come out that way and still ring true to right now and have guys, because I've had guys mention the same thing. Hey, the thumb ramp or the way the yeah. back is or the way the ergonomics are. You know, I really did try to make the best forward and reverse grip fighting blade that I possibly could. Yeah. So it's cool to hear that, that guys are inspired. And with all the blades that have ever been made in the entire world, to have that still be the case is just really, it's humbling, right? Yeah. It's just, it's cool. Yeah, no, that's really, It's kind of like really what you're cool. doing in the book industry, setting well, a new path. Try, Blazing yeah. a new trail. There you go. You there know? you go. Trying to move the genre forward, you know, a little yeah. bit each time and, and get better each and every time, which is also part of this evolution of the blade what because evolution. you have this and then you're like, okay, well, I got that. What about something a little little smaller? Yeah. And then uh, Razorback yeah. right here. The original blade, that's kind of like a rite of passage blade. Yeah. That, that like, that's like the OG, right. original, the fighting blade. But there is certain needs and that's where the compact blade comes in. You know, if somebody has a smaller frame, or they are looking to conceal it really deeply and not print at all, mm -hmm. that's where I would start. It's still an effective blade length, but having a little bit more of a compact grip. You know, everybody's got different size hands too. So you have to have that Some full options. size and that compact. Yep. I, I fully believe that. I think once you get into the world of fighting utensils, fighting blades, and you know this really well because you put it in your books very creatively, uh, that you need a wide range and a spectrum of what's the job and what do I need it for? Yeah. And so that's why everything is purpose-driven, purpose-built. Uh, that obviously is really special to me because of its name and its name rooting with Adam Brown. You know, Adam Brown was an amazing human being, uh, inspires me still to this day as a Christian, as a warrior, as a father, as a husband. Uh, the book Fearless, which I'm sure mm -hmm. you've talked about many oh, yeah. times. It's one of those icons you can't pass up. You've got to dig into Fearless. But he was a Razorback fan, and I kind of took on the Razorback team as like I, my adopted college football yeah. team at the time. And so I was like, I got to name this thing the Razorback because of its back cut serrations and it's red and black. It just made sense to me. So just yeah. a little bit of a little tribute yeah. to uh, a man that inspired me and, and helps me be who I am today. Yeah, a lot you of know. people ask me all the time, you know, what seal book should I read? And, and uh, I always point them towards Fearless by Eric Blum. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it captures so much of Adam. Uh, but there's some things it leaves out because he <laughs> was even uh, crazier and more accident prone than, yeah. uh, than the book will let on. <laughs> but uh, the book is fantastic. And I always recommend that to, to people who are, not just to people who want to know about SEALs, but people that are going through some adversity or, uh, you know, the, and I just, hey, read, you know, read this. And yeah. uh, it kind of puts things in perspective. Um, that's for sure. So this is a second one to come out right there. And then you have a new one out, which I have on me right now. Yes, so this review. guy right here. And uh, this thing's awesome. Yeah, you've like, been comfortable carrying that. I totally forgot days. that I even had it on. <laughs> like it just finds, for whatever reason, and uh, this thing finds its spot, like yeah. right here, appendix carry. And uh, it's the Revere. That's the Revere. Yep, and that's why I say, it's like the Razorback in the original kind of had a baby. Yeah. It took the best of both worlds, put the length in, and then also put the serrations on. You know, some guys like no serrations, some guys like serrations. There's, there's use for both of them. You know, whether you're cutting into flesh or you're cutting into rope or whatever the case may be. Guys like different styles for yeah. you know, their, their cutting techniques. But the Revere to me is, is like the one. It's like yeah. if you had to go to combat, that's, that's the one Take I'm gonna choose. One. Rite of Passage is gonna be the OG blade. Yeah. Compact, summer carry, board shorts, yeah, you gotta, you gotta get the family, you know? You people always ask, I, I'm the worst. So people ask me like, what should I get? What, what, what pistol should I get? What blade yeah. should I get? And I always say, I'm not the person to yeah. ask. Like I don't do any sponsorships for it. And if I do something like a sponsorship for the podcast, I always make sure that there's no exclusivity. Like right. there's, I just can't have yeah. that. I can't, I don't want to be worried about 100%. that ever. Um, so uh, so I'm, gonna, you're gonna, I'm the worst person to ask because I, you've seen my safe uh, or multiple safes. Uh, you see like the knives all around the house. Like you yeah. can't like take a few steps without stumbling over one. Um, and that's just, you know, <laughs> that's, that's, just, that that's just how it is, you know? Yeah. And then here's, this was, so this was the more, uh, the most recent one right here. Yeah, and that's, that's one of the more recent ones. That's the, the Neptex coated SMR. So I named the SMR just short for summer blade. I was literally looking for a blade. Any three of the original blades, they're great for combat and concealed. But what happens if you're out on a boat or you're out fishing or on a beach? And I just wanted to give people an option for a self-defense tool that didn't stand out and look like you were carrying a blade. Yep. So that's where that was born. 
You know, I put a lot of time in understanding how you would be able to grab it from a gross motor standpoint, what the grip felt like, and also the blade design. Being able to cut, be able to have back cut. Yeah. Uh, I think the most unique part of that is the fact that it has a pry tool slash bottle opener on it. And it's just cool. Yeah. I've had a lot of guys out there complain or like, I don't know why it's on there. But my thing is always like, you know, buy it. If, try it. If you don't like it, you can. I'll refund your money. Because at the end of the day, that will not bother you. I tested that thing on two by fours. I tested it in bone. I tested it in all kinds of hard targets. And you don't even know that it's there. Yeah. So it's kind of one of those uh, irrelevant, irrational kind of fears that it's gonna ha- something's going to hurt you. Uh. Uh, but it's just not true. And then the coating, the Neptex coating, yeah. which is what we're using more and more and more on our combat flathead, yeah. but it's a saltwater corrosion resistant coating. It's proprietary, but we've worked on it for years to come up with a, a coating that you didn't have to oil anything, throw it right into salt water, leave it there for three days straight, pull it out, it'll be fine. Yeah. The water will drip right off of it because rust corrosion's a thing to be concerned yeah. about. Summer months coming up uh, or even in hot environments where you know you're gonna be sweating, if you don't take care of your metal and your gear, your ARs, your weapons platforms, your blades, they're going to corrode. They're going to rust. So I wanted to just completely take that away and not worry about it anymore. And you're probably going to see some more stuff from us in the future that uh, nice. that has that coating on it. So yeah. any any water stuff that you're doing, that that's that's the coating. Yeah, I've never seen a coating like this until until you sent uh, me the this right here, the the combat flathead. And people have read the books know that I'm a big fan and people that read this next book in the blood will uh, will know uh, get a, even a little more in depth on this uh, this tool yes. right here. Yes. Um, I have the originals, I have the different wraps, I have the different, so I have quite a few of these uh, and this has that same that same coating on there. That's correct. It's so you totally notice it. Like you notice this is, there's something different about this. What is it? And you think, well, it looks like plastic, but it's not. You're like, this is wild. It's infused into the metal. Wow. So it bonds in this machine. This machine looks like it comes straight out of Iron Man. Yeah. It's like zapping this uh, blended uh, proprietary blend yeah. into the, the metal itself. That's crazy. So that's why you don't have to oil it or anything. Yeah. I mean, if you were to oil that, you would, you would, it would be fine for the rest of your life. Yeah. You know, but that saltwater uh, resistance is awesome. And again, you just can carry that thing anywhere. Pry it, yeah. sc- scratch resistance. The coating is just doing what it's supposed to. So that's the next evolution of the combat flathead to the nth degree. There's no moving parts on it. I put a hole there so you can put a lanyard. There's jimping, the strategic uh, grip points on it. And then there's also some de- detents. If you look at it on the side here, yeah, right here, there's yeah. little detents, which are actually purpose-built for something that I'm designing right now that is going to go along with this. Nice. So there's a very specific sheathing system that okay. we're developing that's going to be able to allow you to go onto Molly and several other platforms. Nice. And also go into some non-metallic stuff as well. Got so it. it's a it's a cool little addition that this is going to fit into when it releases. That's so anybody awesome. that's bought uh, or purchased the Combat Flathead, they'll be able to grab this and put it right in. So I'm pretty yeah. excited about that too. Dude, that's that's awesome. Always no, I thinking. love this thing. I love this thing. You know, the Combat Flathead. I mean, it, and where did it come from? Like you would you did you carry an actual just regular like three dollar dollar uh <laughs> like flathead? Yeah. Black handled steel craft, yeah. stainless steel. Did you uh, have it you have it in your kit? I had it right in my kit. You have either had it right here on the front. Or sometimes I would carry it uh, right in the back where I could pull it out. But uh, Eddie Penny, yeah. which you know, uh, love love you, bro, if you ever listen to this. But one of the most engage, engaging relationships I had uh, overseas was with him. We kicked down more doors and uh, pulled the trigger more than anybody together. Uh, but him and I both carried the flathead. And we would pry, punch, hot wire, tear open, I mean, that thing got a lot of use. Yeah. So when I was sitting there thinking about it one day, I'm like, I need a combat flathead. That's that's what it's supposed to be. So you literally have a tool that can do just about anything and take yeah. with you anywhere. And we just took it to the next degree of being able to conceal it. Now you have a, a tool that's cover for action. All it is is a flathead screwdriver. Yeah. But wherever you want to take this thing, whatever you want to use it for, and again, improvised environment, right? If I want to use this to be able to protect myself or do something with it, as you guys will see, uh, in an awesome scene that's in this next book is just absolutely epic. It can be used. So <laughs> yeah, no, those things serious. I have, I have five or six of these. I love them. And then does it, does every blade come with a, a trainer? Like I got these trainers. Are those? I have the, you got the trainers right here. For anybody looking, there's trainers that are uh, the exact same shape as the actual blades yeah. for for training. Um, so those, those are in there. And then 100%. I love the boxes. Like yeah, the boxes are cool. Yeah. Like that's pretty serious right there. 
Um, yeah, we step up our these. game. You know, the, the packaging is important to me. Yeah. You know, we want that to be tier one just as much as anything else. And we put a lot of thought and effort into housing these things because we know people are buying these for a pass down, something to keep in the family. Mm. Like those fathers giving it to their sons or gifting them. And so we wanted a really, really uh, awesome box to be able to have that keep safe, you know. Yep. No, the packaging. I mean, there's a reason that your iPhone just doesn't come in like a manila envelope or just some, uh, you know, some plastic around like maybe like a, the old, uh, there's a difference between opening the old Blackberries and opening the True. Uh, <laughs> iPhone. I mean, they put as much thought into the boxes as they do into the they actual do. device, um, which is why I do the boxes that I send to people when the, the new books come out. Uh, which are the coolest boxes ever. Oh, thank right? you. You know, just a ton of, <laughs> ton of thought and purpose and all that stuff. Thank you. I'm excited to get the new one. And then these guys. Non-metallics, yeah. got to have them. So if you line it up, I mean, you really see the, the evolution right happening, is that you have the full-size blade, you have the non-metallic to go with it, and you also have the trainer to go with it. So any warrior knows that whatever tool you decide to use, there's going to be a spectrum of uses. If I go in and I say, I want to be really good at firearms training, well, you're not going to get as good as you possibly could and reach your full potential unless you're using a blue gun, an mm -hmm. airsoft gun, a blank gun, a paint gun, a live gun, Oh, they're all important. They all cover a different spectrum. So each one of them has a different principle to apply yeah. in different environments. If I want to use live role players, I can't use live firearms, right? So I have to switch and go to paint or go to blanks. And it's the same thing with non-metallics and trainers is that what environment does that fit into? Mm -hmm. Where can I carry it? What can I use it for? You know, you can use your own imagination with the amount of uses that you can use non-metallics for. But ultimately, it also gives somebody a really cost-effective option and have a very, very powerful tool. The G10 material is very, very strong. I've stabbed each one of those into two by fours with zero issues. We refine the tip on them so you get good stabbing power. And that's really what we're going for is that penetration. Mm. Like blade fighting in the sense of reality needs to be reframed for a lot of people. People don't just die instantly from a blade. That doesn't work that way. Uh, it can, but it's very rare and you gotta be really good to know exactly what you're doing and where you're targeting. Um, and in the fray and in a real combative fight for your life, that can be tough to find. So my point is, is that when you go down to real self-defense, typically I'm going for penetration and targeting and pain compliance and control because that slicing, while it's good, you have to know what you're doing there as well. Like a, a guy that's new to blades, you need to know where your targeting is. That way you know that there's a difference between timers and switches. Instantly, I'm gonna get more of a reaction from you if I know exactly where a switch is, mm. right? I talk a lot in my blade training programs about the ocular shot and how important it is to shut you down with that ocular strike. You can do that with that. You can do that with penetration, you can do that. So it's just, it can, do, you can be used for self-defense just like this can be used for self-defense. Mm. But it's understanding the spectrum of the blade and why they're all effective and why you can train with them, carry them in different environments, like opening your mind outside of that box and understanding, I carry a blade. Well, what environment am I using it for? What's the purpose of it? So what should I be carrying? That has to change. You have to be adaptable and fluid in thinking that way, just like a firearm, depending on the mission that you're going on. Yeah. So, Yep, no, I love all this yeah. stuff, obviously. <laughs> um, and you gave me this belt uh, and the reason you just talked about different environments. Uh, so you gave me a new one. So I have a new one on right now that's uh, a, the, the thinner version uh, of this. But you gave me this belt in, belt in 2015, 15, I yeah. want to say. So, uh, Still holding I, up, dude. It's, it, there's no that's, difference. That's going to go into a museum someday. <laughs> yeah, but it, there's no, I mean, it looks like it's brand new still. And I've worn this every, pretty much every day. Which is awesome, man. Since then. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy, cool. crazy. I'm so pumped. And it still has the quarters that you put in here yep, <laughs> for me the back then. So I got the quarters. Um, so I had this. I went to Argentina recently, uh, and obviously you can't bring a firearm you know, to Argentina. Um, so I went down there, and on the way to the hotel, we had to stay in Buenos Aires one night. So I'm there with our friend Frank, and uh, I got in first, and so I'm driving to the, uh, to the hotel, and you know, getting, getting a little local intel from, uh, from the guy driving me. And he's like, yeah, your hotel, I don't know why you're staying there. He said, <laughs> most people don't stay there. I'm like, oh, great. Uh, so he's like, just don't leave the hotel. You'll be fine in the hotel, but it's uh, you know, high crime. No one's come down here really for a couple of years because of COVID, they shut everything down. So that means the tourism dollars weren't flowing in. Um, so now when they see a tourist, they know you're unarmed and then you probably have money and they're looking at that watch, which is something that um, they, they look at. Yeah, exactly. So clearly. And in my book, I have James Reese's dad, Thomas Reese, uh, have a, he has a Rolex and he's killed in Buenos Aires. Uh, so now 
I'm in, in Buenos Aires with a very similar watch, and the guy's telling me to leave the, only the hotel. I'm like, all right, I can do that. But I have this belt on. Right? Yep. So I have this belt, and uh, so I'm like, I'm not gonna leave the hotel. Fine, I'm gonna go in there, have a have some breakfast, because I got in there in the morning, have a drink, wait for Frank. And of course, I get there, what does Frank wanna do immediately? Leave the hotel. I'm like, this is a horrible idea. Like, why are we, why are we wanna leave the hotel? I was just told by, I love Frank, by local, the way. love you, Frank. Uh, <laughs> so what do we do? We leave the hotel, and uh, we have a, a tour guide that's taking us around the city, and uh, they take us to this crazy cemetery. And the cemetery is gonna get worked into a future novel. It's a great place for a fight. Um, so I'm thinking that as I'm walking, and I'm thinking I'm red selling it from the enemy's perspective, and then somebody comes up to us and is like, hey, you guys are being uh, surveilled right now. And I'm like, of course we are, Frank. We should just stay in the hotel. We're only there for a few hours, you know, one <laughs> night, and we're off to our, to on our hunt. Um, and, but I had this. And so awesome. these two, it's like deserted also. So it's a tourist attraction, uh, this, this cemetery, but it's like deserted for whatever reason. Like, it's not good. So I'm, I'm, my spidey senses are up. You know, I'm looking around. I'm not looking like a regular tourist, like looking down the, the history of the, I'm, I'm aware of what's going on. And we walked, and you're walking in and out of these, like, these tombs are everywhere. It's freaky. And uh, two guys start walking towards us, military age males, you know, and they don't look like they would be wandering around this cemetery just uh, as, because uh, they're interested in the history of it or they have a relative there. <laughs> like, no, uh, but I go to the belt. So I'm like, boom. I'm like, this is what I have on me right now. Nice. I've practiced with it. I've so taken this thing it? off really quick. I didn't take it out, off, but I probably should have. I probably yeah. should have, um, but I didn't. I just had my hand I'm like, okay, here we go. Velcro right there, okay. And I've taken it off, same pants. I've taken it off a bunch of times uh, to get this thing ready. So, but they, uh, so we're walking towards them. My hand's right there. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna grab this side. This is gonna be in the right hand like that. Nice. Boom. And uh, they could tell. Like they could look, they, like I saw them. They walking towards us and they stopped and they turned. Uh, I, so whatever it was, like just being a little bit aware and me going down like this. And I'm like, okay, so this is, we're about to get, this is about to get serious. And I'm thinking about blade, them having blades, me not having one. Yep. Uh, me having this, got a little distance, uh, got my getaway sticks to run. I have Frank, but Frank's a scrapper. Frank's a scrapper. Uh -huh. But I'm like thinking, Frank doesn't have a blade. I'm not, I don't, you know. Uh, so anyway, we worked, it worked out fine. But I think it was just because of the body language. 100%. You know. Yeah, they're prepared. I mean, you can feel that. Yeah. I mean, criminal behavior can pick up on like, okay, these guys are not as vulnerable. And uh, yeah, I'll I love see that real quick. So, you know, the idea of, of having this too as an impact weapon is so important. And like you talked about distance. In some cases, I would almost rather have this than a blade. Mm. Because if a blade comes out, I still have a reach that you don't. And this is a little thing, I don't know if you knew this or if I taught you this yet, but if you Velcro it and you fold it right where the quarters are and you mm. actually anchor it in your pinky like yeah. this and then load your hand, this actually becomes something now you're not gonna be able to let it go. It's anchored to your hand. Oh, so nice. this works really well. I mean, I'm not Damn. even trying to, to yeah. hit. But this becomes an extremely powerful impact tool where you can just do it again and again, Bam. and you're using this thing mm -hmm. uh, in, in the air. So I don't know how people don't travel with this yeah. because it is a real valuable tool for people to have. There's oh, a lot yeah. of gimmicks out there. This is not a gimmick. Yeah. And it will hold up to some serious strikes, yeah. uh, whether it's you know hitting somebody's hand, the head, whatever the case may be. So. I'm pumped that you carry this thing, man. Oh, yeah. And that it's loaded perfectly. Uh, well, you, you, you put it together <laughs> in, in Sometimes people in complain that it's a pain in the butt to load, but once it is, I, I, yeah, it's, yeah. it's definitely That's worth why. it. <laughs> I didn't want to mess it up. I wanted it to be done by the professional, you know? Yeah, I appreciate uh, that. I didn't want you to look at Not it and be like- Not everybody can send it in to help me to load the corners. I know, corners, I know. Though, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't want you to like look at it one day, like, you put them in backwards or they're all messed up. Like, no, those, and they haven't moved yeah. since. Look at that. Like that is the exact same way you put them in there all those years ago. Like yeah. they're in there and that's solid. They don't, they don't make any noise. They don't yeah. slide around. Like that is solid right there. So yeah. and then there's a couple other things. You can, people can go online to find out the other secrets to this belt. But uh, there's some cool stuff here in the in the back. So yeah. I had that in there too. And just yep. you know, just yeah, the to, low, the low pro belt. That's why we designed it yeah. to to not draw any attention to yourself. Have a function that you need to self defense tool in there. Cash documents, hidden keys. I mean, it's it's 
as much as you possibly need yep. and you can get away with it. So Yeah, I remember when you first gave it to me, I was like, because I've been, I came up shooting before the military with guys that carried Cock and Lock 1911s, leather, very thick leather belts, like that sort of thing. So the first time, and even when I was wearing belts for concealed carry, it was still, even if it was some sort of a nylon, it was very thick, yeah. very rigid. Uh, so when I got this, I was skeptical. When they first gave it to me, a I was like, mm. and then I did it and I'm like, oh, well, how have I, has no one else? How, oh, I haven't been using this for it. Well, it just came out when you gave it to me, but uh, but it's awesome. Yeah, it works. No, no buckle too. That was a big deal to me because buckles scratch on stuff. They get in the way. They hang up on your clothes. I wanted buckle less. Yeah, you know, as effective as you could be. And uh, man, it's just great to see it holding up. It's oh, yeah. awesome. That's all these years later. That's seriously every single day. Yeah. You know, now I have a new one. You gave me, the, yeah, but yeah. yesterday or the day before. Uh, so I have the new one that's a little smaller. So I'm gonna give that. But this one's just so comfortable. Like it's. I'm, yeah, like, it will break in. Yeah. I, got, I got the other 1.75, 1.5, but I'll get you another one. Too, I love these. So. I love this thing right here. And then this, you gave me this here recently, yesterday. Um, and this is a slash kit. Slash kit. Yeah. Yep. So right here. So, you know, people always ask me about carrying a, uh, when I, carrying a, uh, a tourniquet and uh, sometimes I post the EDC pics or whatever and people are like, where's your tourniquet? Uh, and usually it's in a, it's in a backpack because yes. I usually have a backpack with me. Usually I have a book in there. If somebody recognizes me, I sign it and give it to them as a, as a thank you. I usually have my computer in there, you know, because I'm going to go in somewhere to write or whatever. So most of the time I have a backpack with me and that's my tourniquet's in there. The blowout kit is in there. Um, usually around here, I carry a bigger one where it's very easy for me if I'm traveling to not forget that it's in there yeah, because there's a because I don't want to lose the, the shears or lose my TSA pre or whatever. Right. So I can just take that thing out and put something smaller right. and always keep that, that tourniquet. But uh, there's something in this that acts as a tourniquet. Yeah. So again, from the standpoint of, of trying to figure out where can we build the thing that's going to be the most impactful for the least space taken up. And that's why we came up with the slash kit. The solo T that's in there is, is the biggest game changing piece of that. The kit itself, I believe, is the most minimalistic thing you need to be able to stop a bleed, to pack a wound, and have multiple tourniquets. Now, I don't want to you know, advertise. I'm sure there's guys out there that are like, don't tell anybody you can do more than one wraps. But I, I did. I stopped three different bleeds with just one kit. And the main thing is that if you have kids, if you have animals, pets, dogs, or somebody with a smaller limb that's mm -hmm. really skinny, Tourniquets don't always seal that wound as best as it could, especially on infants. I would actually beg to say that the tourniquet that I have, the cat that I have right now, mm -hmm. probably wouldn't wrap up an infant at all. Mm -hmm. There'd probably be a lot of space yeah. left. So with five kids and that being a risk, that solo T will wrap down on a wound and wrap down on a limb really well and stop a bleed. So that is a, a major game changer in that kit specifically. And that's why I wanted to make something compact that fit in our slash pockets mm -hmm. of our jeans and gave somebody access to a tool that you might not have your bag. You might not be able to carry your backpack with you, or maybe you're just going out in town for the night. It's kind of a no brainer to me to have yeah. something that you could save somebody's life with. And I just made this kit as a no excuse. Like there's no excuse not to have one of those on you at all times. Yep. Whether it's in the bag or on your pocket, don't deploy from your forward operating base or your hotel without something to stop a bleed, especially from a major bleed, a femoral yep. or an arm or, or a limb scenario. Yeah, no, these are awesome. I'm gonna get a few more of these and stash them around because uh, this thing is awesome. And speaking of, so these are jeans. So you got me, First, you got me out of jeans, and then you got me back into jeans. So, in, once again, 2015, you That's introduced true, me. That's true, isn't it? Yeah. It's true. You introduced I, me to the cold. cool, yeah. yeah. In, uh, in 2015, which I think. Have. Which I still have. Yep. And it was the Covert, which they don't make anymore, but they have a whole bunch of other things out there. But you, so I'd been a jean guy my whole life, always in jeans and, uh, or shorts. And then you introduced me to this thing called Cole. I'm like, with a stretch in here, but it doesn't look like it. And back then, that was like kind of new was in 2015. Cool yeah. yeah. And so then I went to only those. I like, didn't wear jeans again <laughs> until you made these. And, uh, and now you oh, got me back nice. in jeans with these. Yeah. Um, and when you first gave them to me, like, I don't know, three years ago or whenever that was, um, I was like, oh, geez, I'm going to have to try these and they're not going to be any, because it's, it's hard to make jeans. Yeah, you, know, you hear it that. Hard. It's very hard to make yeah. jeans. And I was like, I'm going to have to tell Dom I like them or do I just, do I tell him it doesn't, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, what do I do? <laughs> don't I put them on? Me, bro. I won't. I, I was trying to figure out how best to, you yeah. know, come like, hey. assuming that they were going to be like, I don't know, awesome. Yeah. Like these jeans are awesome. And you asked my wife, I put them on, I'm like, because she was thought the same thing. And because before I even put them on, I'm like, oh man, Tactical something. Does they do like, not look does tactical. She, like them? That's she loves key. them. Yeah. Because okay, she was shocked. Yeah. Like I put cool. them on and she loved that. 
loves how they looked. I loved how they felt. They, they, they were great. Yeah. And so, which was shocking because I was prepared in my mind. I'm trying to figure out, like, I don't know what am I going to tell them? <laughs> uh, but they're awesome. So, uh, so I love these jeans. And here are the new ones. Like you, so these are the new ones that you just brought yeah. me the other I'll day. I'll tell you what. Making, are these different than the ones I have? Are they the ones I'm wearing? So the, the slash pockets and the, and the nine pocket style is kind of threaded throughout a lot of our builds. Mm-hmm. But the material's different. The, oh, wow. thread, the threads are different. There's some key features on that that are slightly different, but we stick with the signature on a lot of things. Like the multicam waistband is obviously a cool feature that no, you don't yeah, yeah. know unless you know. Uh, they're all made in the USA, 100% made in the USA. That was That's a big deal. And that's also makes it even more difficult mm-hmm. to make something here with that level of precision. Yeah. I had no idea the, the journey that I would go on with apparel, but I love doing it yeah. and I love finding out more. So keeping these things consistent in the US has been a challenge. Man, but those are the new wedding. ones. Those are like the gray. They're like a gunmetal gray. Yeah, yeah. Those are the Umbras. Okay. And they are so comfortable and they don't look like they're like a yeah. stretchy pair of pants. No. But they are super dynamic. I mean, you can do squats and anything that we sell. Yeah, yeah. No, these are yeah. all, all awesome. And what, so what started you down the apparel? So obviously, you know, it makes sense. You're getting out. You're a combatives guy. You're a knife guy. That You're going to do blades. But what led you down this apparel route? And then well, what, what's Adaptive X and how is that? Uh, yeah, so Adaptive X, Adaptive X was something that was born when I was starting to build different types of material, combative stuff, and just being adaptive. I wanted the, I wanted the equipment and the apparel that we used to be adaptive. That was the idea of it. Uh, I then acquired Oxcart, uh, which mm-hmm. was a company that was doing really well. They were doing some cool stuff. How did you know how to do that? I wouldn't know how to acquire anything now. I have no, like, how just, did you? It just led me down that road. I just, I do research. You know, anytime we go to do something, we do it to exhaustion, right? So I'm like, in, well, first let me just give you a little bit of background. The leaf system from Arcteryx, mm-hmm. basically it was me and Adam Brown and a couple other guys that helped develop that entire system. Wow. And I'm sure there was a lot of people that had their hands on it, right? But Adam and Brown and I were really adamant about working with uh, Kramer yeah, yeah. And, and that whole crew to be Great. able to bring that thing to fruition. So that was fun. Yeah. So I've always loved apparel and I've always loved every, everything's is the same to me. What socks I have on mm-hmm. or what blade I'm carrying, they're all part of the lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Like n- none of that is separated from the other. You have to have the lifestyle, mindset, training, and gear. And when I got down to apparel, I eventually got to the point where I'm like, man, I just, I don't have any pants that don't look tactical and have the type of function that I want. Mm-hmm. So I was starting to go down the road of being like, I'm just going to make my own. Mm-hmm. I have no idea what that's going to look like, but I'm going to make my own. I actually started man, the money that I spent on trying to develop some of this stuff. You know, <laughs> I can only imagine. Seriously, man. I spent so much money. My wife was like, what are you doing? Yeah. You know, I, I developed, I probably have 50 designs that just haven't gone anywhere yet, yeah. but I have a pattern for them. Okay. And I started to develop jeans, mm-hmm. a low-vis combat, combat uniform, and several other items with this uh, third party company. Mm-hmm. And when I did that, we eventually got to the point where we we're getting ready to build. And they sent me a sample back and said, here's your sample of the first thing. And I opened it up and it said, it was made overseas. Uh, it was like made in Bangladesh. Okay. And I was like, well, I was like, is this what we're gonna have to, I was like, why are we making the pattern there if we wanna make it in the US? Right. And they're like, well, that's gonna be really hard and it's gonna be really expensive. So all that momentum and time came to a screeching halt because oh, I didn't wanna do it overseas. Right. Having said that, fast forward a little bit, I was still adamant about creating my own clothing and own apparel because I want to be able to live in what I'm saying I'm developing right. and it fits the lifestyle, fits the gun, fits the, the, yeah. the hidden reduced signature aspect of things. So I started to go down the road as like, okay, if I make the best pair of jeans in the world, what does that look like? That's when Oxcart started to surface. Okay. That's when some of these key elements, there were some key relationships and things that happened along that journey. Yeah. I was like, you know what? This guy's actually making a pretty good pair of jeans. Hey, instead of going and trying to do it all by myself, let's partner together. Mm-hmm. And that ultimately led me to buy his company. Wow. And I bought the company outright. Uh, we acquired all the intellectual property and everything that goes along with it. And then I started to design from the ground up with wow. some of those patterns, the new designs that you're seeing here. Yeah. And I've since then just learned so much about materials, gear, and everything else. Um, we have so many designs in the queue, but like I talked about before, I got all these ideas in my head. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to build a thousand things, right. just don't have the funding. Yeah. And that's just the journey of Dynamis. If anybody knows what we've done, they just see things come out slowly. Yeah. And I'm on just this slow, slow okay. quality journey, you know? But that's what is important to me, to have apparel that guys can use out in town that yeah. don't look tactical right. and still have the same level of function and the ability to be dynamic. 
Yeah. I mean, that's that's the theme and that's the goal. Well, they do. I mean, you've, you've hit your goal with, with all of these. There's nothing that that I, you've ever sent me or that I've ever ever acquired that uh, that you've made like this thing. I carry, carry this thing for a long time. The reduced signature trauma kit right here. Yes. And, uh, you know, that fits in a pack or whatever else, like super, super easy. Uh, but all this stuff, like everything is so well thought out. Yeah. Um, obviously, you red sell it to the nth degree. Um, it, it, it's I do. Awesome. You know, the thing that comprises everything is is the reduced signature yeah. and the low visibility lifestyle. Because ultimately, the tactics, the gear, the apparel, we're not just one company. We don't just do blades. We don't just do jeans. It has to fit mm -hmm. in that low visibility lifestyle. You have to want to be prepared. Mm -hmm. You have to have the right gear to do it. And I want to make the best stuff in the world. I want this stuff to be tier one quality. So it all fits that. Right. You know, and there's also the IWS system, which I think you saw. Yeah. And the IWS system allows you to integrate everything into the waistband. You know, that low vis kit, that reduced signature trauma kit, you know, goes in the center of your back or fits in your kit. It just has allowed you to do, you know, multiple things with it. So yeah. it's cool. And the poster that you gave me the other day, like it still hasn't gone anywhere. Like this thing is in there. Yeah. You're not adjusting it. Like it's, you know that, awesome. I mean, you forget that it's there, but you forget that it's there because it's not shifting on you. I haven't gone back. I've only gone back to check it just to be like, man, that thing is Good. not. That's music moving. to my ears, man. You know, like yeah. the other things, I'm I'm constantly kind of moving. I'm aware that it's there because I want to make sure that it's still in the right spot. It's shifting a little yes. bit in and out of cars, you know, picking the kids up, you know, just move, they're living. This has not. And we've lived the last couple of days. We were we've been in multiple locations filming the book Being trailer video for yes. the next yes. for, for in the blood and uh, in and out of helicopters. And this thing right here is still locked into the exact same yeah. place that we uh, that we put it in uh, the other day. So that thing is that thing is crazy. Good. Yeah, I'm um, glad you're enjoying it. Again, it's it's tough because we're not a holster company. Right. You know, there's a lot of great holster companies out yeah. there. But when I decide to build something. I want it to be the best. Yeah. You know, I want I want it to have precision. I'm not just going to do it to do it. It's got to have that reality to it. So even have an adjustable retention is like if you're fighting, that thing better stay on there. Yeah. You know, the clips better work. It better grab. It better do what it says it's supposed to do. Like that's always the key for anything that we build. You know. That's crazy. So this is like when from your first piece of kit until now, um, did did some of the gear go alongside with the training or did you start the training first or are you still training? Like what's what's going on Both. right now? Both, it's a great question. Um, that's another thing where I always talk about the conversation I had. I had some investors earlier on that I didn't actually take any investors on, but I had some guys come in and kind of give me advice hmm. and some guys that I didn't know, some guys that I knew, but they were essentially like, hey, you got to make a decision. You can't do both. You're either doing training or you're doing gear. Which one is hmm. it? I had a guy ask me almost in that tone of voice. Mm. And I remember it pissed me off. Yeah. I was like, I was like, who, I don't know who recommended this guy. But this is not <laughs> who I want to talk to. Yeah. Don't tell me what I can't do. Right. You know? And in the command, when I knew we're training with the gear that we use, the gears being used in the training that we have, they both get put together to go deploy, to go on the op, to be able to hit the X. Yeah. That methodology should not change for anybody. I see over the last several years, people are starting to get it, hmm. but it's really freaking challenging in the civilian world to put these two things together, yeah. especially from a monetary standpoint. Yeah. And that's been my struggle. I've tried to hire staff to be able to train the techniques that I want to train. Mm -hmm. I've been able to try to build, uh, last year, I just tried to build a, a web platform that completely failed and mm -hmm. fell flat on its face right off the bat, did not do what I wanted it to do. I had a huge vision of this online training portal. Mm -hmm. uh, Neither one of them came before the other. They both came together. I was literally doing open enrollment courses mm -hmm. locally in Virginia Beach, not even advertised, just putting flyers up <laughs> as I was making the blade. And so they've always been put together. I'm gonna teach you the tactic and I'm gonna give you the blade that you need. I'm gonna mm -hmm. give you the blade and I'm also gonna show you how to rep use the reps with it. So I don't think you should separate those two. Use an analogy of a firearm. If you go buy a firearm, it's your duty and responsibility to go get the proper training with it. If you don't, you're doing yourself and everybody around you a disservice. And that's how it is with anything we sell. Yeah. If you buy the jeans, know how to use them. If you buy the blade, know how to use it. If you buy the med kit, know how to use it. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that's true. So I still have a vision of keeping them together. I have some online training platforms that, I, that I, uh, I'm using. So we have modules. I have blade modules. I have mm -hmm. firearm modules. They're at a base level. I have like blade one, blade two, blade three, and, and then so on and so forth. So that I think is going to continue to grow. The the open enrollment stuff has been challenging because I have to travel. Everybody wants you. you want, they want you. And because I tried to scale, man, 
If you guys are listening to this and you're anybody that scales uh, training, good on you because it's very challenging to take alpha personalities and to be able to lead them down a road where they're successful and, and you help the company and you work as a team, that's challenging. That's really freaking hard, man. It is. I tried it several times. And I think that there's a way to do it, but you've, you've got to be just creative mm -hmm. with how that takes place. So scaling that and not working, I know that I can't be everywhere at once, and I don't necessarily want to be some of these guys that are out there every weekend. I Training. have five kids. They deserve mm -hmm. my time. I can't travel all over the country. I don't want to do that. So I want to do it strategically. I still do private training. I still do guys from a very uh, high level and engaged level. Mm -hmm. Some guys are private clients that come out to our facility uh, several times a year. Uh, I'll do private events if it makes sense and mm -hmm. it's somebody that I want to work with. But I'm very, very strategic about when and, and how I do things. Yeah. Uh, there's actually a couple opportunities, opportunities coming up right now that I'm excited about. Nice. But full circle to answer that question is that the gear and the training need to go together. They have from the beginning, and I want to keep it that way. And so I always recommend that. And while I'm not in person doing it, I always recommend guys go look at our modules and they get good reps in. There's a free firearm safety course that I offer on my platform. So if anybody has even picked up a gun and wants to know from the base level standpoint, mm -hmm. like just going to our website and saying, okay, what are these? Put your kid in front of them. I do a test at the end. So I try to do it differently than anybody else that's out there in the industry. Uh -huh. I just think about it a little bit differently, a little bit more of the mind, mm -hmm. not so like, hey, treat every firearm like it's loaded. It's right. deeper than that. So I think that that's a good base. And so I always encourage people to have both nice. and do both really well, you know? Yeah, yeah, man. Is it all under Crush Everything now? Is that is that the new? It is, yeah. So that's the new so brand name. Everything's there. Because I'm like, you I changed it this companies. year. Yeah. I did. I changed it this year. I put under, everything under uh, CrushEverything.com. I had Dynamis. I had Adaptive X. I had Adaptive Fight Gear. I had, what else did I have? Armor Up. Yeah. Um, that's probably going something on. I'm missing too. Probably. But uh, Neptune. Neptune Blade uh, uh -huh. is in there. But I've got multiple things that I'm working on and I'm like, okay, how do I consolidate all, the, all this? Yeah. And so the idea was crush everything being a lifestyle. Like if you're literally living with that intent, with your mindset, with your training, with your gear, with how you're engaging in life, I'm like, well, you are crushing everything. And to me, that means something. To me, that really means like you're actually engaging to the fullest extent. And when it comes to our lifestyle, I'm not just talking about going to be a good coach in front of a corporate entity. Mm. I'm talking about being the warrior, you know, living as the warrior, protecting your family, living with good values, being strong, working out every day, uh, being engaged with your community, uh, doing the repetition that you need with the tools that you say you're going to deploy when somebody kicks down your door. That's what's important to me, mm -hmm. you know. So I tried to consolidate everything as much as I possibly yeah. could. I mean, it looks been, great, crush everything. I mean, when you first let, told me it was coming under there, I checked it out and uh, checked it out uh, again this morning, actually, yeah. just to get more familiar We're with it. We're redoing the website already. Oh, you are? Okay. Yep, 100%. I'm not adapting. happy. Always adapting. I'm not happy with how it came out at all. Mm. I knew right away it fell flat on its face. It's been, it's been, constructively irritating and I've been developing a new one behind the scenes. Okay. So the new one's going to be coming out soon. Nice. I'm pumped about it. Okay. Like nice. It brings all the gear and all the things that we're doing to life. Yeah. Finally, uh, working with my buddy Josiah on this and uh, nice. his company is just super, super yeah. engaged. For the I mean, yeah, reasons. you have to keep adapting like website, having ones that are, that are laid out in a way that makes sense for the person that uh, sees it for the first time. Uh, you know, that's maybe a first impression, perhaps a second if they saw you somewhere else or got a reference from somebody else or whatever, but it has to be laid out in a way that, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that makes sense and doesn't cause someone to say, wait, what is, you know, it can't be questioned. Yeah. It has to be very clear. And that's yeah. been tough. Yeah. Telling I thought that, it was pretty good. Telling that story is really good. Well, it's good. That's yeah. good because that's what I want to do. Somebody like you probably gets it because you already know what it is. Yeah. Um, but I, I do want to be able to get to the heart of a person that's never been there. Yeah. You know, maybe they hear about the belt, but then they don't realize, hey, you should train with that. You should have mm -hmm. the right mindset. So it's just really getting across that this is a lifestyle. Yeah. You know, once you're in it, it's like embracing it to its fullest extent. So rebuilding it. We'll yeah. see. You nice. know, I want to get that message across. I just want to increase people's ability to, yeah. to see what's important to me. Yeah. yeah. Well, you learn so many lessons. I mean, in the military, you're constantly adapting. You're out. Now you're an entrepreneur and you're uh, doing things that are passionate, that you're passionate about. Uh, what are some of those lessons that you learned uh, in business um, that, uh, that, 
that you're like, oh man, if only I'd known that earlier, oh geez, I would like to pass this along to somebody just leaving the military or somebody, not even leaving the military, starting a business or whatever. Like, what are some of those things that you've learned, talked about principles in the term, in the, the sense of principles, yeah, like being principled, right. but what are some of the principles that you have uh, uh, incorporated into the business side from lessons learned? Like you've been out for a while now and you've done, you've you've been in this space for a while now and you're constantly adapting and you're, you're never satisfied with how something is and you always want to make it better. So what are some of the things you've learned uh, as an entrepreneur or in the, in the business space that are, you think are the most valuable? I think right off the bat, I would say have more faith. You know, we, we tend to get wrapped up in things that we want to impose, mm. you know, our will on so much as opposed to like, what am I being called to do? Yeah. You know, what, what's most natural for me to do? And what do you love to do? You know, where's your heart fired up the most? Like, what are you so passionate about that you can't take the smile off your face? Mm -hmm. And that, that flow state or that zone that you're in. I would argue that in the sense of business, that it would be worth risking everything to find that and stick with it regardless of the risk mm -hmm. and regardless of what the world will tell you to do. Because even though from a worldly sense of success, it might not add up to what everybody on Instagram is telling you to do, you'll be fulfilled more than you could possibly imagine. I think that that is what I would tell anybody going to chase anything is that making, making sure that it's for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. you know, and for me, that has been deeply rooted in faith and knowing like, what am I being called to? Like, is this what I'm actually supposed to do? Or am I just trying to impose my will on the world because I just want this to happen because of X, Y, and Z? And that's, that's where I keep talking about this idea of living radically different than mm -hmm. the world wants you to. Because first we have to define success before we even go into the, hey, this is where my business ventures have led me to. Right. This is what I've learned along the way. Is success as the world sees it, an easy one is that, oh, you become a millionaire or you're financially free. Well, you may financially be free, but you're a slave to something mm. that you've created that you're completely unhappy with. Like that sucks. Mm -hmm. And I've gone down those roads. I've been like, wait mm. a second, what am I doing here? I'm fighting myself on this one area. That's not what I built this for. Yeah. And it's a challenge in today's world because next thing you know, you're doing what you love. You're making a little bit of money. And then next thing you realize you have to pay taxes, you have to <laughs> fill out business licensing fees. You're like, wait a minute, what is this state tax that I had no idea that existed? Ugh. Wait, I have to do an audit on my inventory every year? Like yeah. this stuff can consume you yeah. if you let it. But if you're doing it for the right reasons and that outweighs the why, mm. right? Well, the why outweighs what these menial tasks that you have to accomplish, it can be worth it. But again, the first and foremost thing I would make sure that people are passionate about it and that they love what they're doing. Yeah. And from a standpoint of business, there's so much to learn. And I've learned so much along yeah. the way of these multiple businesses. But I've now having five kids and a family that I really want to spend a lot of time with, it's been this shift in understanding, is this going to allow me to create more freedom with my time? Mm -hmm. Because if my time is... I want to spend more time with my kids. I want to just take this Friday off. And, you know, maybe my daughter's struggling with something. Mm. And I'm like, I just want to go hang out with her. Well, do I have the freedom to actually break away from the business that I created? And mm. if the answer is no, then I didn't do it for the right reason. Mm. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot to talk about from business, but, you know, that's, that's the base of it. Yeah. No, I'm hoping that one day you put this down, uh, you know, put it down in a book. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about that in the past. And, I know it's something that you've, you've thought about, but whether you're capturing those lessons for your, you know, your kids, whether you're catch, capturing those lessons for a future generation who I think are in desperate need of, uh, you know, well, I'll say in desperate need of heroes these days. Like when we grew up reading uh, about guys in World War II or Korea or Vietnam, yeah. um, you know, we look up to those guys or seeing a movie or a documentary about them. Um, and today there's so many other influences out there uh, that I think kids in particular need people to look up to these days. Um, so I hope you capture whether it's business principles or leadership principles or uh, mindset principles uh, or all of them combined or whatever it might be. But there's some, some really cool stuff there. I know we've talked about it a few times, but um, I'm hoping at some point that that gets on the list. Yeah. yeah, I've started down that road. You know, you certainly feel the need to take your experiences, take your adversity and apply them so people can learn from them, right? 
if we go through these experiences and we don't actually share that with somebody else, like think about all the guys that have gone before us that were great leaders that influenced us, how good they were at storytelling, mm -hmm. how good they were at passing that knowledge down to their families, that everybody gets around the same table, nobody's on an iPad, and they tell the story. This is the adversity that I went through. This is the challenge that I went through. So there's definitely truth to that, to being able to capture those. And I think that that's the motivation for me is to make sure that they're, they're told if I have something to learn from, if I had pain that I had to go through, that I would be doing everybody a disservice if I didn't try to at yeah. least stop them from making the same mistake. Right. I think that's, that's why I'm so passionate about raising good kids, yeah. uh, keeping each other accountable as brothers, you know, growing in faith is that we're missing this. Yeah. And we need to realize where it came from, take our own experiences and then teach the next generations. Talk about heroes. Who are the kids' heroes today, yeah. right? It, it's scary to think about, it really is. And we need to bring that back as much as possible. I think the element of writing a book is fun. It's fun to think about. Yeah. You know, obviously you've been a huge inspiration in that. Mm -hmm. Just seeing what the impact that you've been making is just freaking awesome. I oh. geek out with it, I love it. Oh, um, I got a bunch of family members that just appreciate it so much. Yeah. Awesome, man. Yeah, um, my father-in-law is one of them. But these guys love this. They love the fact that you've been so creative with this. And oh, uh, to me, it's like, okay, I'm like, I could probably make this happen. But like you said, you, you isolate and focus and lock down. Yeah. I think that that's what it would take. It would really take me locking down some time yeah. to say, all right, pray through and work through what's gonna be the best thing for me to write. Yeah, you, know? and you got a lot, you have, you have so much going on, obviously with <laughs> all these different businesses, all these different directions, uh, making these products that are incredible. Um, and then the family part, you know, you can definitely tell like when you had a shift uh, from all this, all in on this business stuff. I mean, you can see it on lots, but that's the good thing about social media and the bad thing about social media, I guess, is that in today's world, that authenticity piece is so important because people connect with it and they can tell if you're not, if you're fake out there. Yep. Maybe let's say 1985, you didn't know if a the word influencer didn't exist, but let's say a celebrity or whatever who you looked up to, you have no idea if the three minutes they spend on a late night show, if that's really them mm -hmm. or they're just out there for the, doing, answering the questions for three minutes and they go back. But today with all that engagement, uh, like the real you will come out will. for sure. And having that foundation of authenticity with your engagement uh, online, publicly, whatever, however you want to say it. Um, but it takes time because there are a lot of people out there to engage with and to thank for yes. like, for me, I want to thank everybody that uh, says they got the book and they loved it and they told a friend, like I want, I th want to thank every single person and give them that heart late yeah. at night or whatever. Um, and you were out before I was. And so I got to watch you and I got to see, you know, how you did this social media thing and building these businesses and utilizing platforms, adapting that didn't exist 20, 30 years ago. Um, and then I got to see, and you can sense it online that you shifted this priority to family in there. I did. Um, it was there a certain point where you're like, wait a second, what am I doing here that you can pinpoint? Or was it just kind of like a buildup over time where you're like, I think it's time to focus over here with these little people that need me? Yeah. I think both. I think both for sure, because there's, there's elements of that that over time you start to realize like what's most important? You know, that's the question that we have to ask ourselves every single day that we wake up. What's most important to me right now? And I think a lot of people miss doing that every day, mm -hmm. to be willing to reprioritize what you thought you knew, you know? Because if we don't really know that as truth in our own lives, we're gonna miss something, but not be so closed-minded enough where we miss what's new, who we're becoming. And family for me is that, and, and having more children, having five kids, you can escape it if you have one. You can fudge it if you have two. But when you have you three, have four, five, five you really have to confront what you're doing as a father and how are you influencing their lives? So for me, it's, it's both a gradual understanding of being a better father and uh, uh, moments that hit me along the way where it's like, I'm in the kitchen sitting here trying to post, you know, and how dare I? And it, and it does make me sick to my stomach because I've done it and I'll even do it next week if I'm not aware, but I'll be sitting here and I got my three-year-old, daddy, daddy, dad, look, I want to show you something, dad. Like, yeah, yeah, hold on, one, one second. second. Right? Oh, I know. Like, if I do that, then I'm missing everything. I know. I'm missing everything because they need me in that moment. And like, I get so fired up about it because I've had this battle and this struggle of not letting that creep into the fact where it's pulling me away from what my kids need. Mm -hmm. Because all of a sudden you put the phone down 
I'm like, Daddy, look it, I just wanted to show you this one thing that I made for you. And it's like a picture of you guys, you know, and her telling you that she loves you, mm -hmm. right? And, and if we miss too many of those, their hearts become hardened, mm -hmm. right? And they start thinking, oh, maybe the device is more important than me. I know. Right? And then they capture that idea mm -hmm. of, well, then I'll just refer to the device because clearly that gives me more attention than my dad does, mm -hmm. right? Then what shift are we making in our, in our lives? Mm -hmm. So it's a deep rooted conversation I have with myself, with my wife, with my family, with the people that I love, with my brothers, that we have to continue to make this a priority. So family's for sure shown me that in my own heart. And that shift for me is absolutely genuine. I hope that if ever mm -hmm. tested, the man that I am behind the camera is absolutely the man that I am when I'm talking to my wife behind closed doors. Because that's what the real truth is. I'm not being anybody for anybody else. Nope. I told you before we even started this, I was like, one of the most profound things in the book, The Warrior Ethos from Stephen Pressfield, is at the very end where it all culminates, is that the hardest thing in the world for a warrior to be is himself. And I think that we fight that. I think we fight being ourselves in so many different ways with our culture tearing at us from every direction, um, doing it for the likes, doing it for like, oh, look at me, uh, look what I can do, look what I'm capable of. I've seriously questioned my motivation mm -hmm. of being online, of being outwardly a presence yeah. because I had momentum, you know, and, and did I have it for the right reasons? Um, I don't know. And as I've grown my faith and my ability to understand my family, I think it's made a big shift in understanding like, I don't want to ever get to a point with so many, I'm so thankful for the, all the older people in my life and all the men that have ever come across my, my path and say, I didn't get enough time with my kids. Mm -hmm. My kid's a train wreck now because I wasn't there for them. Or I'm dealing with this issue because I did this as a parent. Mm -hmm. It's like, those are like, those are just arrows that I'm putting in my quiver that I'm just loading up mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I'm reorienting myself to say, never will that be me. It will never be me sitting on my deathbed saying I could have done more for my kids. Mm. I'm going all in now. That's why I brought my boy with me on this trip. Yeah, it's awesome. Like I, I refuse to sacrifice their time for the sake of something that I think fits the world's narrative. Um, and so I'm radically challenging all of that right now in my life. Like you're meeting me at a point where I'm, I'm not even posting much anymore. Mm. Um, newsletters, all that. I'm completely refiguring and challenging the status quo. Um, I've, got to, I've got to read this quote from my buddy, today because it's that powerful and I don't want to mess it up. But my buddy Austin, one of my brothers from home, sent this quote and it's true, I believe, for everything that we have in our lives. Um, the gift of a beginner is fresh eyes. The longer you're in a field, the harder it is to perceive new truths. Your mind is biased toward refining what you're already doing instead of exploring fresh terrain. Take your expertise and apply it to something new. So the idea of the fact that we're tainted with this, this whole vision that we've been framed in on and grown up with since birth, I challenge this. This is really, really intriguing to me. But we've been programmed since the day that we were born from right here. And that kind of like freaks me out a little bit to be like, okay, well, what do I think I know is true that actually isn't true? Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I'm at that point right now. I'm, complete, I'm flipping tables in my life to, to search under them to make sure that I'm living it to the best way possible. Yeah. According to God's will, according to my will where... I wanna be the best freaking husband that I can possibly be. I wanna be the best father that I can possibly be. Like that's my goal, best father in the world. How do I accomplish that? I'm on that journey to figure that out. Like-minded men, great fathers, great husbands, keep each other accountable, hold each other to a higher standard. I mean, these are all the elements of a warrior. These are all the principles and, and morals, values of a, a warrior culture. Uh, a, a society with great men that come from it is all these mm. same things that we've been missing. You know, this big arc of, what we've lived by and now what we think we should live by, yeah. you know? So anyway, lot to, lot to go on Dude, there, but yeah. ultimately it was about being uh, a father and shifting to my family is that I'm giving them everything first and then I'll see how that plays out with everything else. Yeah. I'm not trying to appease everybody first out, outside of my home. I'm trying to give them my heart and then I'll see what's left afterwards. Dude, I mean, I, I, mean, so I think you're always leading the way. Uh, I mean, you led the way out of the military. I was looking at what you're doing. You gave me something like I didn't know what a, I no social media whatsoever. I didn't ever had a Facebook account. Never had Instagram. Never had any of that stuff until I started it for you know for 
for the, I mean, for the business because um, that's your storefront essentially these days. That's your, we talked about that yesterday. It it's uh, yeah. you know, that's my general store. Good analogy. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. I think so. That's how I looked at it. Um, you know, whether I had one, <laughs> one follower or whatever I have now, um, but uh, being in there managing that cash register in that general store. And if someone comes in and asks me for directions, uh, I want to give them directions, even if they don't buy anything um, because that's, you know, that's a good thing to do. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, that can get overwhelming now when you have all all of these people coming to the front door. So it's something to, to think about and that. I think about that all the time too. The, uh, oh, just one second for the kids. Oh, just one second, hold on, hold on one second. Oh, when I catch myself doing that, I just, uh, it, That's a trigger. So yeah. I just, yeah, that is. And I think, cause I don't want their memory of me to 100%. be of me, up, you know, standing a little taller than they are, uh, looking at a phone saying just one second, like that. Yeah. Oh, if that's yeah, that's my challenge. That's my challenge to you. Yeah, you know, yeah. Knowing how much you have going on, knowing what it's like to be able to do this, I think that uh, that idea that you had about where you were going to put your phone was a great one. I think things like that, these these mechanisms, like for me, phones are not allowed at the table. Period. End like of story. It. I don't care who you are. My yep. house is no exceptions. Uh, so when we're eating at the dinner table, it's conversation. It's full on engaged. Yep. Everybody's there, and the the fruits that come from that are amazing. But having strategic places that that it's controlled. Um, but then also the trigger of not another second. You're more important to me than exactly. this thing in my hand. Yes. Exactly. And that's hard. I with, do that. I make that conscious yeah. effort to like, if I was about to say that, like I put it down and I turn, you know, and, uh, but in the back of my mind, so I want it's so that, that little acting takes place there because in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh, what's going to happen to this thing I was just doing? It's going to disappear. Uh, who knows what's there. Eh. And, and you know but what? I need the, to get rid of that too. You know what the thing is about uh, that is I'm at the point where I'm radically challenging that whole concept, which is exactly where I am right now. Cause I, I've probably tried to post, I would say honestly, 20, times in the last maybe two weeks, yeah. three weeks, and it all gets overwhelmed by something. My wife will call me down like, you know what? I'm going to go talk to her. For mm. me, it's very organic when I'm, when I'm doing something or I'm posting. Mm. Um, scheduling it, we talked about that. Like, I think that's cool. Yeah. But a lot of what we do is like on the fly, we're feeling it. Like, hey, I want to be able to get this out there right now. But that, that is an interesting space. You know, my challenge to anybody listening is to be able to put your kids first, put mm. the people that you love first, put that thing away. It's not as cool as the flesh and blood that's sitting right near you. Yep. No, exactly. So my, my plan, my new plan is to have it, turn that into a cord and turn it into a uh, cord like you used to have back in the day and plug it in upstairs in my office so that if I need to use the quote, the phone or the device, I have to physically go up there and, and sit down and do it so that there isn't an opportunity for me to be like, oh, I have five seconds here while I'm waiting for one of the kids to go to the bathroom before I get in the car. I'm just going to do a quick little check here and say thank you to a couple of people. Well, if I was going to do that, I'd have to work my way up to that office, yeah, sit down, I love that. turn it back on, and there wouldn't that, be time for it. So it doesn't yeah. happen. You put it in so, its place. Yeah. You put it where it belongs. And I think you, so. you, you control it, you know, um, as opposed to it controlling us. And we know this idea, we know it's a threat, right, to, to get in the way of our lifestyle, our happiness, our family. And so if we know it's a threat, we really do have to put control measures on it, yeah. you know, put it in a box in a sense. Yeah. You know? No, totally. Yeah. So that's going to be a constant, uh, you know, once again, something I'm uh, constantly working on, trying to adapt, trying to get better, trying to evolve, just like with anything. But, uh, you know, we can't do this and not talk about Winkler. You know <laughs> what I mean? Oh, yeah. Like, uh, Absolutely. yeah. So this, boom. Uh, right, you get me down. No one does it as good as you, though. Getting it down. Um, so where, where did you first meet Winkler for the first time? Daniel Winkler, for those listening. We talked about him earlier with some of the, some of the blades here and and that sort of thing, but he's such an amazing guy. Where did you, where did you so meet him? So my connection to Winkler began with Thomas Ratzloff. Yeah. Uh, Rat was a warrior's warrior. I talk about Rat a lot. He was a sniper. And he started going down the road of wanting to get the command knife done, you know, the command blade. And once that started, he was like, well, where's the best place I can go for a blade? That led, them, led, led him to Winkler. And I also had some interesting uh, back end connections going on where there was these uh, hatchets and, and hawks being made and axes that were kind of like this unknown little program that was going on, uh, which my father-in-law eventually found out about through a friend. And so he actually called me before Rat introduced me to Winkler and said, hey, do you know about this Winkler guy? And I was like, no, I don't really know if I've heard of that name before. I was like, but let me go do some research. You know, so here I am getting hit from both ends. So then I talked to Rat. He's like, oh yeah, I'm getting ready to work with Winkler. We're starting to build this thing. So I got involved with Rat, helping build the command knife. 
Yeah. Uh, I started to go down the road of, of developing our own individualized uh, acts, if you will. And that, that whole thing was just an amazing journey. And so the first time I met Winkler, me and Rat woke up, I think it was like four o'clock in the morning. We drove down to North Carolina from Virginia Beach. And I'll never forget driving down there and meeting uh, Karen and Daniel for the first time down on their property. And uh, what a blessing, like what an iconic moment. First of all, you know, being with Rat and him not being here anymore. Uh, and then just being able to partner with those guys on so many different things. But just mm -hmm. the, the patriotism, the love, the everything from the Winklers is just absolutely uh, immeasurable in so many yeah. ways. And still to this day, I just talked to Daniel the other day. Uh, we're still working on Blades together, as you can see. You know, that was the icon that helped Dynamis start uh, partnering with Winkler. Just so grateful for everything they've mm -hmm. done. But the coolest part about that trip was we started the prototype of the ax that we were gonna build. Mm -hmm. And he literally took a huge chunk of metal and just ironed that thing up and heated it up and just started hammering away right there in front of us. And uh, still have the picture of that with me and Rat standing there with him in the background. Right at, at the shed, at right off the property, forge. at the old forge. old yeah. forge. Oh man, I love yeah, that man, place. Yeah, man, just like a piece of history there, you know? <sighs> Too cool, so, yeah, I love that property. And, and people will never, no matter how much we talk about it or how we try to talk about it, people won't um, never really get how much they've done for the military, for special operations, for veterans, for 100%. each of us, like individually. Um, yeah, Daniel and Karen are just amazing. So when I when I started down this this path as an author, for whatever reason, I was like, oh, I think I need a, a logo. And so I'd given my kids uh, for my retirement ceremony, I'd given them a uh, uh, a Bible with their name on it, uh, a awesome. hardbound copy of the Constitution, a old brass antique compass, and one of these. Yeah. So they each have one of these. That's awesome. Um, but I gave them the, you know, the Bible and the compass to, uh, to guide you on your way. That's awesome. Um, and uh, the, the Constitution for rights, for natural rights uh, from God, not given to you by, by government, but uh, things that are natural. And uh, then here's the means to defend them. Yeah. They gave each hand them this. That's so powerful, um, man. So I had more than one uh, as I was coming up with this, thinking about, oh, I probably should have a logo or something. And uh, so I took two of them, I put them on the ground in my old office in Coronado, and I took a picture and I sent it to Daniel. And I was like, hey, what do you think of this? Do you, do you mind if I use this as my, my logo? And he's like, absolutely. He's like, it'd be an, it'd be an honor. It's really the honor's mine. But um, yeah, what a great, what a great guy. What Karen's amazing. And uh, obviously, the tomahawk has uh, been <laughs> important to me. I was into axes and tomahawks well before I was even in the military. Yeah. Um, and I have this whole collection of stuff that I've acquired over the years growing up and everything. But uh, uh, yeah, it's a pretty special. It's amazing. Uh, it's an amazing right anchor. It's an anchor for a warrior mm -hmm. and anybody that has uh, deep value, you know, of yeah. that being a part of our history. Um, obviously, I think that you giving your kids the Bible and a compass is just absolutely mind blowing. <laughs> I really do. I love that. Thanks, brother. Um, and you know me and faith right now is like, yeah. I'm just absolutely diving into everything. So, you know, maybe at some point we'll talk more about your faith, the Bible and why that's important. Cause I just, just love that. I mean, I think yeah, it's you saw our family one. one in the house there. Yeah, the that, was, that was that's awesome. That's how you open it. It was like, it's, it's a little, really cool. it's, 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 you know, it was never like outside or anything, but I think just moving between, I mean, it's a thick one. Um, and uh, I think just moving between uh, different places from Virginia Beach back to San Diego, uh, to Germany for like nine months. Uh, then out here in the mountains, I think it's like taking a little toll on it. So I think it's yeah. one just that's gonna, uh, you know, sit there. Uh, but uh, yeah, those things were, I think those four gifts to give the kids really just kind of encapsulated uh, most of the things that uh, that are important and that I wanted to pass along. And hopefully yeah. later in life, they'll be able to look back and, and really think about why I gave them those four things. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Absolutely. or whatever that's it's huge. Worth. But yeah, but this thing right here, yeah. And people are gonna, I think people are gonna have a, uh, Winkler's gonna sell a couple more of those when the Chris Pratt <laughs> series comes out on July 1st, because that thing has a, uh, has a starring role, yeah. uh, and, which, is, which is pretty cool. So uh, I know we talked about the combat flathead quite a bit, but um, I have, like I said, I had quite a few of these. And uh, <laughs> usually there's one right on my desk. And I, I was for, gosh, for the longest time, in interviews, I just have it out, just doing this with it. And then I was like, you know what, I should probably stop doing that because people are gonna think I'm a crazy person. Like if I always have <laughs> I don't this. Think you're crazy, like, <laughs> I think it's very natural. But if you're on like Fox News or you're on whatever else, you know, that I'm always have this this thing in my hand. But it I think it's makes, awesome. It just makes sense. I know. It, you know it what good. percentage of your brain motor cortex is controlled by your fingers? I do not. Forty percent. So by doing things, you know, like the Chinese balls and mm -hmm. things with your fingers, mm -hmm. I always advocate for this, is that 40% of the motor cortex is run by your fingers, 
40% is controlled by your facial expressions, and the other 20% is run by your body. So your motor cortex is actually split up that way. So if you want to refine that motor cortex, your fingers are a really good place to organize it. Really? So doing stuff like this actually helps you. Really? So maybe yeah. I was naturally drawn to that because it was doing helping organize yep. some stuff. And that can be your excuse, so you're less crazy. Hmm. I switched over to a pen, though. Oh. So I wouldn't be like, you know, just have, yeah. I didn't want to be distracting to the person watching also. Right. Like, what is he doing? What is he, why is he, what is that thing? Um, yeah, because I like, because the leather strap one is the one before this came out yep. that I was, that I was using there, the brown leather strap one, because I had the brown and the black also. So I always had the, the brown one right there and just doing this. But uh, uh, I wanted to ask you, what has inspired you most in the post-military chapter in life? And then what's been the most disappointing? Most inspirational and then most disappointing. Well, I think the most disappointing, I'll start with that, is how easily we've lost our way as a humanity and as a culture. Mm. I feel like all those principles that we talk about often that have gotten us so far and kept us so strong, I just see people kind of just throwing away mm. and just giving up. Yeah. And unfortunately, it's the comfort, it's the complacency, it's the culture that we've created that allows us to have that level of comfort. And man, it like rips my heart out. Honestly, when I see people, I'm like, Ugh, this just isn't the way, you know? Just living and existing day by day, shoving the same food in your mouth, watching the same thing, uh, it's just not it. It's not the life that we were made for. Mm -hmm. And we were made for so much more than that. And I think that me not seeing people reach their full potential is the biggest disappointment. Um, and I just wanna make sure that I'm living that out as a good example, yeah. that I teach my children to do that and that uh, we keep each other accountable to that in our communities and in our church. Yeah. You know? um, I'd say the most inspiring thing, you said post-military post -military, career? Post-military, yeah. My faith, yeah. for sure, hands down. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there, but getting back into church and, and realizing what my true calling is has just fired me up more than anything else than I could ever put it, put, in the context for mm -hmm. you, so. Did you get away from it for a while and then come back to it? Yeah, mm -hmm. I did. Um, earlier on, you know, I grew up Catholic. Mm -hmm. I grew up going to church. And I didn't realize what it was. I didn't, mm -hmm. nobody, nobody really told me the, the weight of it and uh, what the real truth was. It was just kind of a check in the box. I think a lot like today, it goes back to that disappointment piece is that it's a check in the box for people. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, hey, I gotta do this, I'm obligated to it. Uh, this is just what I always did instead of actually talking about the meaning and the purpose behind it. So that was there. And then going into the military, I mean, I completely separated from a lot of that. That instance that I had before I went in the military, mm -hmm. you know, where I actually, the thought of taking my life actually entered my brain, like that presence of God never left me. Mm -hmm. So the weight of it being real was like, there's something to this. Then leaning on that throughout my career, I mean, I remember saying prayers together before we went on an op, we went to go do a VI or, or a Target and they were just boom, a chapel would appear or a priest would appear and we'd pray. And I'll never forget how spiritually armed I felt after that. And I knew that there was something there. And so all the way through my career, you know, being a team guy, I don't think there's really anything more worldly than being a team guy, to be honest with you. Um, imposing our will and doing what we do and living in the flesh, there's, there's a lot to that. Um, and so experiencing that level and then knowing that that was there, I think coming back to it was really the helo going down, mm -hmm. my mom passing away, that whole thing we just talked about mm -hmm. without actually refining my faith, I have no idea where I'd be right now. Wow. I have no clue. Um, Cause it was, it was rough. So to be able to go back to that and like, oh, there was a true calling to be able to lean back on that. My wife was a huge part of that for me. Um, and then that, that journey right there is just super, super yeah. inspiring. And still to this day, like, there's nothing else that fires me up more, so. Nice. Oh, man. Man, yeah, you can tell. You can see in somebody's eyes when they're passionate about something and it's true, you know. Um, and you talk a lot about assets and liabilities. And I think about that uh, a lot, wanting to be an asset to, uh, to myself, to yes. my family, to my community, um, as a citizen. And I think people go through, can go through their entire lives now and never think about that. Am I being an asset or am I a liability? They never even ask that question because they're too busy maybe being controlled by the devices we just talked about or they're just on a path that they're supposed to be on. 
uh, quote unquote, supposed to be on. Um, and they don't really know why. They're supposed to get a job. They're supposed to do this. And then they're supposed to pay these bills. And you know, a lot of people are doing these things and haven't listened to that calling. Or maybe they had it when, uh, before they got too old or had these responsibilities. There was a calling out there, but they didn't listen because there are too many other distractions these days. Uh, and they were distracted by those instead of, what's that calling? What's my mission? What's my, what's my purpose? So I love when you talk about assets and liabilities, and I think about that all the time, not just am I being one, but how am I being a better asset? How am I improving myself uh, as a citizen, as a husband, as a father? Um, so assets and liabilities, like where did you start first start to think about it in those terms without just kind of knowing it, like you wanna be a better team guy each and every day, you know, you wanna make yourself earn that trident every day, you wanna be a better operator every day, but where did you consciously think about, ah, you know what I'm actually doing here? I'm being an asset to my troop, to my team, to my squadron, uh, to enable special warfare, to my country. Um, where did you really put that into words and recognize it consciously rather than it just being an unconscious thing that you do as a team guy? Yeah, and I, I think that that's important to understand is that it is an unconscious thing as a team guy. You kind of naturally put those two in their boxes. Mm -hmm. As you grow, you know, like, that guy's not doing what he's supposed to do. That guy's the guy I'm going to follow. Consciously, I think it really started to take shape when I was starting to teach more about how to respond to a threat with your family. Mm -hmm. Because when I really started to identify, wait a second, I don't actually have all my team guy buddies around me. It's not just me and Jack. It's, it's me and my infant and my wife and maybe my next door neighbor. So then categorizing mm -hmm. who you're around takes an extreme value knowing how to utilize them at their full potential mm -hmm. and then how we need to respond. So for me, if I identify, I have a whole methodology on this that I teach to my, my guys that, that train with me, is the question I would ask anybody listening and to you is that if a threat pops up, how we respond to it, is it going to be different if we're by ourselves or with our family? And the answer is 100% absolutely. Because if I'm just me, I can be selfish. I can be like, oh, okay, I'm getting shot at. Let me just go around the building and find some cover and flank the guy and come down on my terms. But if all of a sudden now, my seven-month-old Joseph is sitting strapped into a carrier at the door, and my wife went in the kitchen to get her coffee, and I'm sitting in that chair and somebody kicks in the door, it's not about Dom. It's about how do I be a shield in the best possible way to save and protect and be the shield for my son and my wife and my family. So that dynamic of being able to understand who you're around takes critical mass. So now I need to know there's a liability with me and mm -hmm. Joseph's a liability. He can't protect himself. He's strapped into that carrier. And if he ever gets taken away from us or harmed because of our, on our watch, I mean, shame on us right? Yeah. Lose sleep for the rest of my life. So you have to be deliberate and intentional about categorizing and identifying who you're around. I do that with everybody that I'm with. Mm -hmm. I did it since the day that I st stood <laughs> here and with the guys that are running the cameras and actually know these guys pretty well. And I'm actually a pretty good confidence that they'd be able to take care of themselves. I put them in like the independent category. <laughs> um, and we actually have a scale that we go off of. It's called the Leah scale. And so I actually have independence in there as well something you probably don't hear very often, mm -hmm. but there's liabilities, there is independence, and there's assets. Mm. So the independents can actually take care of themselves. Okay. That's law enforcement officers. They're really, they're trained, but I'm not gonna really expect them to come take care of me. Right. So you can see how if I go down this path, identifying who you have around you is really important. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm going out, I'm with all five kids, they're all strapped into the back of the minivan, my wife's with me, I know her level of training, and we're going to link up with Jack, mm -hmm. right? So now I'm linking up with an asset, that is gonna be able to help in this scenario that I know if I went to the bathroom, they're gonna have some type of a protection because they're worth another asset. Mm -hmm. If I leave, I need to have that in the back of my mind where maybe my time away isn't so long or prolonged mm -hmm. or get caught up doing anything because they need me as that asset with them. So it just frames your ability to think about the environment that you're in. And I challenge everybody to do it wherever you go. Um, I always talk to people I speak with. I'm like, if I don't know you, you're a liability. Right. I don't know your level of training. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, I need to treat you as if I need to protect you and save your life. So that's the way I'm going to respond. Can anybody that's a liability rise to be an asset in the moment? A hundred percent. Could a guy that knows nothing all of a sudden come up behind me and hand me that that Winkler axe, say, Dom, here, I pulled this off the table. I'm like, dude, yes, high five, awesome. <laughs> Give me that thing, right? But I don't ever expect that mm. because if it comes to fruition, then great. 
Uh, a liability is somebody that you need to think for, you need to think ahead of, mm. you need to be involved with, you need to be the shield for. So they take a lot more thinking. Can an asset become a liability? Well, in the standpoint, let's just put it into the uh, combat, combat text. Um, yeah, I could be fighting with you alongside of you. All of a sudden I get hit in the arm. Now I'm a liability, right? Well, hopefully not. I can still fight. But say I get hit in the leg, my femur goes out. Now I can't get to the door effectively. I become a liability. You need to be able to take care of liabilities. Mm. Infants, family members, people that have no training or really untrained um, and then injured teammates. Independence, law enforcement, no, no offense to law enforcement at all, by the way. Like I love law enforcement, uh, really appreciate everything they do for our communities and keep us safe. Uh, but ultimately when they come on the X or they take care of a problem, they're not there, there to save you, they're there to take care of the problem and as how it should be. Um, but we need to have that personal accountability to it. Also, I'm confident that they could take care of themselves. Uh, could they come into a room and be able to put a master plan together to be able to protect everybody in the room? I don't know. That's, that depends on their level of training. I'm not going to assume that. Assets are force multipliers. They are irreplaceable. There are people that when they leave the room, it sucks. That's what an asset is. Mm -hmm. And that's what we should all be striving to be. That's the pinnacle. Um, we could go under each one of those categories and say, well, how, does, how do you define that? Right? And I would, I would challenge everybody on the fact that being an asset is unique to your situation, to who you are. Mm -hmm. If you're the only one around the children, you are the asset to the children. You become the asset. You become the highest level of protection and knowledge and capability for the people that you're with. And I think that you should define what an asset means. For us, very clearly, that has a tactical sense to it. Mm -hmm. We need to be well-trained. We need to be capable. We need to be able to deploy weapon systems. We need to understand structures and how to deal with them. We need to deal with multiple attackers. We need to deal with our families. Like, that all matters. So define what an asset to you is and then understand the contrast. So to me, there's a, there's a power in knowing who you're around. And it's not, it's not even from a standpoint of judging. It's just the reality of the situation. We're here to do a job. We're here to live out life. I want to be prepared for it. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's really the way that I look at it in a snapshot. And then getting deeper on that, you have to train that. You have to know that. You go through scenario training. You walk in the room. You don't know who's in there. Clearly, that person's a liability, and I need to respond this mm -hmm. way. Now, again, it's very easy for me to talk in the tactical sense, but this is true also even in a family dynamic. Yeah. Right? You go to a family outing or you're at an Easter dinner. It's like, who are the liabilities in this room? Mm. Right? Who do I need to look out for? I'm gonna stay, I'm gonna pay extra attention to that person. You know, is Uncle Joe used to getting drunk and falling off the back steps? Well, Uncle Joe needs some special attention. I need to make sure I'm thinking for Uncle Joe. Yeah. Uh, the kids, is there a pool in the backyard? You know, if there's an uncovered pool and the kids are playing back there and there's kids that can't swim, that's a liability. Pay attention to that. It's our responsibility and duty to get ahead of that and think for them. Mm -hmm. You know, are we back out there? Are we creating an intermediate? Are we have a lifeguard on duty? You know, so like mm -hmm. all these things apply to every aspect of our lives, but what's unique to you? Yeah. Yeah, I know. I love thinking about things in those in those terms. I mean, you, it's just a very natural thing to think about, but I love how you put uh, you put terms to it yeah. rather than just having it be something that you just did. So I really like that to put, to put the requisite thought in there. And, uh, you know, we've talked before about... Um, you know, honoring our brothers that didn't make it home, uh, honoring those that didn't, that maybe made it home, but maybe made it home with some, uh, some injuries, uh, physical, emotional, whatever it may be. Um, but how do you live your life thinking about those guys moving forward? Um, how much of, of your life moving forward honors that sacrifice that they made? Yeah. Um, it's obviously a very important thing for us, right? It's very real. And uh, I feel like it's such a heavy weight, but a blessing mm -hmm. at the same time to be able to carry. And honor for me has become an anchor. It's a foundational part of my life. It's where a lot of what everything else begins with. Honor helps me create a filter. So when I know for real the sacrifices of the men that I stood with and what their lives consisted of and the young men that had relationships and marriages, and especially their children. You know, the, the energy that they were bringing into this world, and then having them pulled away. I can only get a glimpse into the history that's been built upon where we stand today. No matter who you are, no matter where in the world that you are, there's this incredible foundation of honor that's been put uh, before us. 
And to think about that, I think should sober up anybody and to really take that at its value. Mm. So for me, it's something that I confront every day. Um, obviously, I have a morning routine. And the second that I put my feet on the ground, it grounds me to everybody that's gone before me. The flashes of the faces of the men that I loved, uh, you know, they, they come into my forefront of my brain. So no matter how I'm feeling, no matter uh, what the day is going to be, it gives me no freaking excuse not to stand up and give it everything that I have, not to put out a thousand percent. So I carry that weight and I feel like it's a blessing to have known so many of these guys. And I think way back, uh, the world wars, uh, the wars that have gone before us, uh, all the way to anybody in our history that we could account for that's fought for our freedom to sit here and do what we do right now, it deserves attention and intentionality. So I, I carry that weight with honor uh, and uh, a certain sense of motivation for sure. It's a part of our daily lives. Uh, my kids do a daily honor code every day to say to honor the men that have fought for my freedom that have gone before us and that have given their lives. And I think that that needs to be rooted in anybody that's a decent human being knowing how they are able to do what they do right now. So clearly that's an important subject to me. I try to make human systems daily and weekly that remind me of that weight and that sacrifice so I can never go a day without forgetting about it. Man, I think uh, I can't think of a better way to, to end this conversation than that. So, uh, bro, thank you so much for, uh, yeah, for being here. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for all you've done for me and my family in particular. Uh, I'll never forget it. Absolutely. And uh, thanks for you know, living life and being that example that you are. Thanks, bro. It's been an honor. It's so uh, humbling to see everybody while I was out here too. And uh, God bless you, bro. And Thanks, just nothing but the best. And just so excited to be a part of this journey with you, man. A special thanks to our presenting sponsor, Navy Federal Credit Union. I have been a member since 1996. There is my cue card right there. Man, Navy Federal has been with me every step of the way uh, while I was in the military for those 20 years. And now that I am out and they've taken care of me, taken care of my family um, and have had nothing but the best experience with them. So to have them sponsor this podcast is uh, well, it's humbling and I am, I am honored. Uh, becoming a member at Navy Federal Credit Union lets you experience more from everyday commutes to your next big vacation. The flagship credit card earns you three times the points on travel so you can get rewarded for wherever you're headed next. Plus, this premium travel card has a low annual fee of $49 and two times the points on all purchases outside of travel, meaning the rewards don't have to end even when the vacation does. Speaking of rewards, you can get a Navy Federal Auto Loan and reward yourself with a new car. Applying is easy. You can do it on their mobile app, online, or by phone, and it's so fast, you can get a decision in seconds. Navy Federal has great rates on auto loans. Plus, with their car buying service powered by True Car, you can shop, compare, and get upfront pricing on your next new or used car. At Navy Federal, members are the mission. Navy Federal is insured by NCUA. It is open to the armed forces, the DOD, veterans, and their families. Flagship rates are variable and range between 10.74% and 18% APR based on credit worthiness. ATM fees for cash advances are up to $1 at non-Navy Federal ATMs. Credit and collateral subject to approval. Message and data rates may apply. Visit NavyFederal.org for more information and to apply. I want to thank my friends at Black Rifle Coffee for sponsoring the Danger Close podcast. I've been a huge fan for the longest time. Drink Black Rifle Coffee every day. And if you keep your eyes peeled, you will notice that perhaps Chris Pratt is wearing a Black Rifle Coffee t-shirt, not unsimilar to this one in the Amazon series adaptation of the Terminal List. Now you can go to blackriflecoffee.com slash Danger Close and use code DANGERCLOSE20 at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. Black Rifle Coffee, America's Coffee, keep crushing. Thank you so much to Six Hour for jumping right on board out of the gate to make this podcast 
possible. Obviously, I am a huge SIG fan, having carried the P226 on every deployment downrange in the SEAL teams. Uh, but SIG was a supporter. They were friends well before uh, I was a New York Times bestselling author, uh, well before I even had an Instagram account or any social media presence whatsoever. So thank you guys all so much. Uh, Ron, Tom, Jason, everybody at SIG who gets up every day and continues to crush it and lead the way. SIG is always adapting. They're always at the forefront, whether it is firearms for citizens, whether it's firearms for our military, ammo, suppressors, optics, training, fire control units. They are doing it all and they are always pushing, pushing that envelope and trying to do it better each and every day through innovation and adaptation, they crush. So thank you so much for that friendship and support. Uh, it will never be forgotten. Welcome to the gear highlight portion of the Danger Close podcast. This is for part two of my two-part podcast with Dom Rasso of Dynamis Alliance, crusheverything.com. And in that first one, I talked about all the blades that you can get uh, from Dynamis Alliance through that through that website, the training, the trainers, uh, the combat flatheads. So go to that first episode and check out the gear segment to learn more about those blades. In this second part, I want to talk about the rest of the system. So this belt, I've been using this belt since Dom gave it to me in 2015. Absolutely love this thing. It has some secrets as well. Um, like it holds quarters in there. Like if you need to use quarters in a parking meter, if you can find one that still takes a quarter uh, or a payphone, not really. It's uh, It has another purpose, but check it out. Dynamis Alliance, uh, crusheverything.com. There'll be some videos that talk about how you can use this belt and the secrets that it holds. It comes in this size and I just got this uh, smaller size right here. This is a newer one, newer version, but it, it works the same way as the other one does that I've been using for all these years. Uh, once again, talked about that blade, those blades in the first one, but uh, this is my first and I love this thing right here made by, uh, well, it's Dynamis Alliance blade, but it's made by Daniel Winkler in North Carolina. And this thing is just sweet. Love this blade, but, uh, works with the belt as does this holster. So right there. And I think even without a belt, this holster is not going anywhere. So check that out on the website as well. I got my SIG P365 in here, but, uh, yeah, that is a well thought out, well designed holster. So check that out. There are also jeans. And uh, at first when Dom gave me these jeans, I was like, oh man, how am I going to tell him I do not like his jeans? Because it seems like it'd be something very difficult to design, but uh, put them on, loved them instantly. And uh, right here. So Adaptive X is the uh, jean clothing line through Dynamis Alliance, crusheverything.com. But uh, love these things. They have that stretch in there and uh, they have some secrets as well. So go check out those, those jeans come in a bunch of different colors right here. I just got this color the other day, but uh, it all works together and it's all very well thought out. And if you know Dom Rosso, then uh, you know that he is going to not take any shortcuts ever, uh, especially when it comes to this year. Thank you for tuning into the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. To find out more about Dom Rosso, go to crusheverything.com. Find out about blades, about training, about everything that he has going on. You can follow Dynamis Alliance on Instagram, Dom Rosso also on Instagram, but be sure to check out crusheverything.com. Tons of great info there. If you like this conversation, be sure to leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow me on the social channels at Jack Carr USA. You can go to the website, officialjackcar.com to stay up to date. You can sign up for the newsletter there and you can go to jackcarusa.com for the merch. Thank you so much again for tuning in. Take care out there. Be safe, stay strong. Keep fighting.